repeat these structures, uh, you're going to induce electric and or magnetic dipole moment in each of these uh, uh, elements. And those induce electric and or magnetic dipole moments can re-radiate. So for the observer looking at this entire structure, the observer can actually evaluate some effective permittivity, effective permeability, effective index, and so on. So you can engineer by this you know, structural combination, you can engineer uh, the values for the effective permittivity, permeability, and index of refraction. One of the interesting point about this topic is that you have a lot of uh, degrees of freedom that you can control. For example, you can control the composition of this inclusion, alignment, arrangement of this inclusion, density of them, the host medium, and uh, also last but not least, the geometry and shape of this inclusion, and particularly with the advent of uh, uh, nanotechnology and nanoscience, the making of these inclusion to the uh, sub-wavelength domain, particularly as you go to the shorter wavelength like in infrared and uh, visible, becomes in fact even uh, more interesting in, from the point of view of nanotechnology. Now, uh, over the years, many groups worldwide, you know, have uh, uh, developed metamaterial. These are just some samples of uh, many groups all over the world. And of course, I can show you pages and pages and pages of different examples of different groups have done this. So this just gives you, you know, some idea of how these metamaterials look like. Now, coming back to the specific topic of the, the talk today, one of the projects that we have in my group is to see whether this concept of metamaterial can help us in uh, connection with artificial intelligence, neural network, machine learning, and optimization, and so on. This is a long-term goal we have, but in order to make it more specific, we said, okay, let's ask a more specific question. And that is, could we have metamaterial that can help us in information processing, informatic metamaterials? And to make that even more specific, we asked the following question. Is it possible to have metamaterials that can do mathematics for us? Uh, kind of like, you know, uh, photonic mathematics or microwave mathematics in the sense that the material and waves can give us, you know, interesting mathematical operation and eventually solve equations. So what is the goal? The goal is the following. Imagine that you would like to design a structure that uh, consists of these elements that you see over here and these elements with the proper shape, proper material and proper location you like to design such a structure such that when you have an arbitrary wave coming and hitting this structure, and when you look at what comes, it comes out of this structure, you would like to make sure that the relation between the field distribution outside versus the field distribution inside in terms of a space distribution, that relation would be the transfer function you like to have. Now, I emphasize that there is general, generality of this. In other words, you would like to actually design a material that would give you the transfer function you like to have. So when you actually send an arbitrary wave over here, you would like the output to be that mathematical operation, that transfer function acting on the input. Now, this, in a sense, fall into the category of, you know, optical signal processing or microwave signal processing. And of course, optical signal processing has a long history. Here, I show you, you know, some sample of the work over the many years, you know, going back to 1970s, you know, and so on and so forth. And coming back to more mod, uh, recent times as to how various different groups have looked at, you know, for example, combination of Fourier optics with the lens structure and so on and so forth that can do a lot of interesting image processing and information processing. But what we like to do is different in a sense that we would like to make to, to show that the materials, how we can make materials that can do information processing. Now, of course, the simplest and oldest example of a structure that can do mathematical operation for us is basically a convex lens. We are all familiar with convex lens, and convex lens will do Fourier transforming for us. And in fact, that is basically basis behind the whole, you know, uh, imaging industry. That with the lenses you can actually form images and so on and so forth. That, of course, is a very very old example. 
But what we are asking is different. What we are asking is that, okay, Fourier transform is a very well-known transform and the convex lens can do Fourier transform. But can we actually design a structure, a new type of lens, a new type of structure that can do other transforms? Not just Fourier transform, but other things. For example, let me, let me give you some, some, uh, uh, some examples that we have uh, studied. For example, imagine that you would like to design a structure over here such that when the wave is coming with some oblique angle over here, you would like this wave to focus obliquely at some other location. Now, regular lens, of course, when you send the wave over here, is going to focus it along the optical axis. Or if you tilt the beam, uh, the focal point would go the, the, that direction. Here, we would like to see whether you can actually design it in any different combination you like to have. And uh, the question is, what kind of distribution of the material would give us that? So if you use the concept of you know, uh, design optimization or inverse design, for example, in our theoretical work, we came up with this distribution, which consists of two materials. The blue one, the blue region is just air, and the red region is a material with a, a permittivity of 1.5, for example. Now, this is very interesting. It's a non-periodic system. You see that in, at first, you cannot guess what kind of function this structure would do. But when you do actually numerical simulation, you see, in fact, it does what we, we plan to do. So rather than using a mirror and a lens in order to achieve what we want, one structure, for example, can do this for us. Another example, by the way, is uh, if you like to have it uh, imaging that is completely oblique. I mean, this could have an interesting application <clears throat> in various form of imaging. So for example, you have an object and you would like, this will form an image, not necessarily a standard lens, but in a very oblique or broken optical axis lens, so to speak. This one also, we have done this design and this design using the inverse design is give you that type of, you know, structure there. So this is just, you know, a preliminary example. I wanted to see that what would happen if you use the concept of inverse design in order to have something other than the regular lens. But now let's actually make it more uh, interesting. So about six years ago, uh, we proposed the following idea. We, we asked the, the, this question, is it possible to get inspiration from electronics, and we are all familiar with the circuit elements, the inductor, capacitor, resistor, transistor, and so on, that when you combine them together, you have an electronic processor. Can we actually do this for materials? Now, back in 2005, almost 15 years ago, I introduced the concept of optical metatronics at that time. That was a lump circuit element. So we said that it's possible to have nanostructures that when you illuminate it with light, depending on the material of this nanostructure, these nanoparticles behave as optical capacitor, optical inductor, optical resistor. So with that inspiration, we said, what would happen if we can have combined materials that would do processing? The same way that in electronics, you combine RLC and you have a processor like filters and so on, could we do that, for example, with the nanoparticles? So back in, uh, in 2014, we proposed this idea that is it possible to actually have layered materials with the proper thickness of each layer, with the permittivity of each layer chosen, such that when you send a monochromatic wave with the arbitrary profile into this structure, by the time that wave comes out, obviously it's the same frequency because it's a linear material, but the profile of that can change. So is it possible to design this material that the profile of the wave that's coming out resembles the derivative of the profile that's going in? So kind of like you have a material that would take the derivative for you, kind of like a differentiator, but in space. And indeed, one of the applications we had in mind at that time is how to de uh, design a layer or very special type of lens, if you will, such that as you send the wave through this, it will take the second spatial derivative for you. Now, why were we interested in the uh, second derivative in space? Because the operator of a second derivative or Laplacian in general, is a very good operator for edge detection in image processing. In image processing, if you actually get the distribution of intensity of the image and you do the second differentiation with respect to X and Y, you actually can pick up the edge uh, of an image. 
So what we wanted to see is whether we can emit a material in an analog system. In other words, there's nothing digital over here. It's just the analog wave, such that when it goes through this, by the time it comes out, could we actually have edges of the image to show up? An interesting point is this is completely analog and it's been done with almost velocity of light over here. This was a theoretical proposal that we proposed in our paper six years ago. And after that, several groups actually experimentally showed this, that indeed that's possible. So that was very encouraging for us that indeed it's possible to make uh, surfaces and meta surfaces that can do mathematical operation. So with that excitement, we decided to put our goal in a, in a more ambitious uh, goal. We asked the following question after that. Now that we know that we can design a material that can do mathematical operation for us as the wave goes through this, for example, so, uh, for example, uh, take, uh, uh, finding the derivative of an arbitrary distribution, finding the second derivative or integral or convolution, all of those uh, we propose, what if we ask ourselves this question, is it possible to design a material that can solve equations for us? And in order to do that, we decided, as my friend Sidik mentioned, we decided to actually pick a general class of equations, which are usually hard to solve in other ways, and that is integral equations, particularly the Fred Holm integral equation of the second kind that you're all familiar with. This is the Fred Holm integral equation of the second kind in its general form. It's a linear equation. Uh, the, the I sub in is the arbitrary input that you put into the equation. And the kernel is given. This is a kernel. And you would like to know what would be the output or what is the solution to this integral equation function G for any arbitrary input that you put there for a given kernel. First of all, before I go any further, I'd like to uh, uh, point out something interesting here, is that we wanted to keep this problem as general as possible. So intentionally, the kernels that we are going to choose, as you will see some examples, these kernels, argument of the kernel is not y minus y prime. In other words, this is not a convolution kernel. This is the argument is y comma y prime. So it is not y minus y prime, number one. Number two, the, the limit of the integration is from A to B, so arbitrary limit. It's not from minus infinity to plus infinity. Intentionally, we wanted to choose uh, the, the category of integral equation that it's not a convolution, because convolution can be done by Fourier transforming and so on. So the idea is the following, that we have to have a system that symbolically is shown over here. You need to design a material structure over here that would do this integral operator for you for a given kernel. But then you also have to create a feedback system over here. So with that, if you send an arbitrary input, which represents this i, and you're going to see some example of that, when this input goes through here and goes through this structure, you know, and we get to steady state CW system, then what coming out of this structure, we propose to be the solution to our integral equations. So this is an ongoing work, by the way, in my group. In fact, I'm showing some of the results that you know uh, just I've, I've come out and some of them, uh, I mean, submitted for publication under review. So we are right now working at two different platforms. One platform is to use the inhomogeneous permittivity properly selected, and you're going to see some examples of that, both theoretical and experimental results. And the other one is to use a collection of uh, couplers known as Mach Zender interferometers. I will talk mostly about this part and then few slides I have towards the end of my talk about this other platform, which we'll talk about it as we get to that point. Okay, so let's start with the first platform. So imagine that you have this integral equation and, uh, and what we need to do first is to design a distribution of permittivity as a function of X and Y such that when you have an arbitrary function, this is a monochromatic signal coming in, but the profile in space is arbitrary, such that when this profile comes over here, when it comes out would be the integral of that input multiplied by that you know, kernel would be over here. So, uh, so when we do this, then the next step is to create some waveguard system, some feedback system, such that you also have some directional coupler 
in which case when you send an arbitrary input over here this goes through this and uh, some kind of like this if you think about it now the reason i show this symbolic picture over here is that you would say okay this looks like a bunch of ring resonators uh, but that's not the case it's bunch is bunch of you know uh, like a ring structure but they're all coupled through this region and this region is that middle material that we have to design so this is the key point because that region is the one that couples all these rings together such that it can solve equations uh, so so the first example so i'm showing you kind of like a chronologically the first attempt we made we said okay let's try to use a, a, a kernel like this there's nothing specific about this kernel this kernel we chose uh, first of all is a real quantity and you notice the argument is not y minus y prime but this kernel is separable so this was an easy start that we had and we said okay how do we design a permittivity distribution that give us this kernel so you start with the flat uh, I mean uniform permittivity and by the way so uh, this integral which is a continuous integration we discretize that in terms of you know five discretize input and five output and uh, and then we say okay if we discretize this kernel becomes essentially a five by five matrix so 25 numbers coming from this and then we use the method of inverse design which is one of the interesting uh, category of optimization there are different techniques and the inverse design has become very popular these days many groups you know have done that you know uh, uh, Yelena Vokovic, you know, from Stanford has done a great work in inverse design. Uh, Oleg Sigmo, Ole Sigmund, you know, and so on. I've done a lot of uh, interesting, uh, I mean, inverse design technique. And so we use the inverse design in order to actually come up with the distribution of permittivity that will give us this kernel. So here, for example, it, it shows what optimization that we did gives us the distribution of permittivity as a function of space. And the color that you see over here, the, the gray scale, when it is bright, is epsilon assumed to be one. When it is dark, epsilon is two. And everything, you know, distribution over here. Now, this is nice, but this is not uh, desirable because that means I have to have an inhomogeneous uh, distribution of permittivity for all those values between one and two. That would be hard to make. So what we did, we actually tried to binarize this in order to have only two materials. In other words, this distribution of two materials. And when you binarize this, you get this. Now, this, in fact, is only two materials. The, the white region is epsilon one or air, and the dark region is epsilon two. By the way, there's nothing magic about two. In fact, when I show you the experiment, we chose a different number there, but this was just, the, just to see whether the theoretical approach would work. Now, so what does this mean? This means essentially you start with the material with epsilon two, and then you create holes in them, holes of air. So it's kind of like reminds of a Swiss cheese. So in my group, we call this a Swiss cheese. It's like a Swiss cheese structure, but the location of those holes and the size and shape of those holes are very important. I mean, that actually is a critical value for this kernel to develop. So this is a, a simulation of electromagnetic distribution inside of this when you excite it to this port. And you see how this is actually di uh, distributed. And by the time it comes out, if you look at the field that's coming out over here and look at the complex number of each of these four, it's going to give you the uh, one uh, row of that kernel that you have. Now, the next slide is showing, you know, when, oops, the next slide is showing the simulation when you excite different ports of that. And indeed, if you do that and you come at the output of this, you see a five complex number here, and then you have five complex number here, five complex number here, that becomes the 25 number that you have for that matrix you have. By the way, in this case, the matrix happened to be real, but you're going to see also the complex matrix as we go. So then we decided to put, you know, this feedback over here and with the directional coupler that you see over here, and we decided to have some, let's say, arbitrary input. So we decided to input to be 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. By the way, this is not a digital input. The reason we show it as 0, 0, 1, 0, 0 is just to show that this two and this two are not excited. And this is excited by monochromatic wave with the amplitude one. That just means this, as you can see it over here. You see what happens? This wave gets into this Swiss cheese or labyrinth structure there. It being coupled and then when you do, when it, this does, and then you come over here and you read 
the five complex numbers that you have over here, that five complex number is a solution to that integral equation. Here, this is the comparison that we have. So uh, the horizontal axis is the name of the waveguides, waveguide number minus two, waveguide number minus one, zero, one, and two. And the, the solid line shows the real and imaginary part of uh, the output that mathematically we should get from that integral equation. And the dashed one is the result of our simulation that we get there when you're excited like this. So this was encouraging. Then we changed the input. You notice now this input now is 0, minus 1, 1, 1, 0. Now obviously, the output would be different because it's a different solution to an integral equation. But the kernel is the same. And you notice this one is also agree well. And then uh, so, so this was our very, very early uh, simulation that encouraged us that the system is quite promising. So then we decided to actually study this more thoroughly and try to do the experiment. So this is the structure. Now it's got a little bit more uh, sophisticated structure that we have there. And we decided to do experiment on this. So in order to do experiment, we decided to use a kernel that is much harder than the kernel we had before. So this kernel that you see over here does not represent any physical phenomena. This is just a mathematical kernel that we chose. And it's a very general, it is uh, uh, complex, as you see. It is not translationally invariant. In other words, you, can't, you cannot write this as y minus y prime. And, uh, and it is not separable. You cannot write it as multiplication of two kernel, one of them with y, the other one with y prime. So this kernel, you know. So we use the concept of inverse design. This time, since we wanted to build this, we chose a material that we always use in microwave. You're all familiar with that, you know, Rexolite, uh, with a permittivity of 2.53 and a very low loss tangent. So when we use this kernel and we use the inverse design, we got this distribution that you see over here. So the red region is that Rexolite or polystyrene, and the yellow region is air. And we have to put some absorber over here. Just to give you an idea, by the way, this experiment, which I'm going to show you the result, we did it at 4.38 gigahertz. So uh, this size is about four times the wavelength. It's almost like one foot, 30 centimeters. And this one is about eight times wavelength, like 60 centimeters that we have there. So then we did a series of simulation just to make sure that everything is, you know, as we predict should come up. And then we designed it. And this is the rendition of the design we have over here. And you see how uh, interesting shape of this labyrinth distribution we have there. And then uh, uh, we, I'm going to show you some simulation result again. But this one, you know, with this arbitrary input, uh, this arbitrary input just simply means the port 1 is not excited. Port 2 is excited by monochromatic signal amplitude 1, monochromatic 90 degrees out of phase, not, not excited 180 degrees out of phase. And this uh, is the distribution you get there. And when you look at the wave that's coming out, that's the solution to our integral equation. So here is a comparison between the simulation and the exact result we expect at the five waveguides port that we have there. And you notice quite nicely, real and imaginary part, each one of them simulation and theory agrees very well. So we decided to build it. And this is the structure that we built. This is a photograph of the structure that you see over here. You notice there are five uh, waveguides, and these five waveguides, each one of them, two coaxial cables coming over here. The five uh, set of coaxial cable for the input that's coming, and the other five is for the output that you're receiving out of this. And let me show you now the experimental result. So this, again, we excite you know, one of those ports. So this is excited by monochromatic signal here and not excited the other four. Uh, the, the orange. And the green you see is basically the input. So the orange is the real, uh, and the and green is the imaginary part, which, of course, this is real, so it doesn't have imaginary part. But the other curve are six curves that you see there, consists of three pairs of curves. The dashed one is the theory curve. By theory, I mean the result that you expect mathematically to get from that integral equation. The real shown by red, the imaginary part shown by blue. The thin one is the simulation that we expected, simulating the structure you know, using full wave simulation. And the red is the re uh, real part, and the blue is the imaginary part. And the experiment is the thick curve that you see there, real and imaginary part. And you see 
all of them agree quite nicely. So this was very encouraging. So this Swiss cheese structure actually is solving the integral equation for us for that kernel with an arbitrary input. So when we change the input, obviously the, uh, the solution to integral equation will change, but our gadget actually speed out the function that would be the solution to our integral equation. So you notice that we try different inputs. And of course, any other inputs would be linear combination of all of this. So this indeed works nicely and is a coherent system. Now, with that uh, encouragement that indeed this device can solve integral equation, we said, oh, let's be even more ambitious. Let's see what we can do next. So we said, okay, there are several directions we are taking this one. One direction is that we ask ourselves even tougher question. We said, okay, we were able to design a Swiss cheese that can solve a class of uh, integral equation with a given kernel, but arbitrary input. Can we do more than that? Can we actually design one Swiss cheese metamaterial that can solve more than one integral equations at the same time? In other words, because in waves, waves can go to each other without interaction, we said, why not take advantage of electromagnetic wave that we can have more than one wave at the same time in order to solve two different class of integral equations with the same single structures? And the answer is yes, that's possible. So here we went back to this idea, but this time this design becomes harder because you have to design a single inhomogeneous material over here such that it will actually give you two kernels over here. If you operate it with frequency omega one, the output of this would give you this integral operator with the kernel K one, but it's same structure. If you operate it with frequency omega two, it's gonna give you a different kernel. It's gonna give you K2 and K1 and K2 are two different kernels. And then of course the feedback and so on, we have to put there. We designed that. So for our experiment, we decided to have two arbitrary kernels. So these are kernels. Again, these kernels, you notice they're complex kernels. They are not separable. In other words, you cannot have each kernel multiplication of two function, one of U, the other one in V. It's all non-separable. And they are not actually also translationally invariant. In other words, you cannot write it in terms of U minus V. You cannot do that. So then uh, we decided to uh, design one Swiss cheese that when you operate it at frequency four gigahertz, you get the kernel one. And when you operate the same structure at frequency five gigahertz, you get kernel two. And this is the distribution of the material. Again, same Rexolite that we had in microwave. And this one shows the complex, uh, 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 complex plane and two different colors you see over here. The blue one represents kernel one. And this shows 25 uh, pairs of blue. Those are the 25 elements of the kernel matrix of K1. You notice the solid circle is the result of simulation of our design. And the open circle is what theoretically we should have from that kernel. And you notice the agreement is very well. And in the same structure, if you actually operate it at five gigahertz, it will give you the complex number for K2. And you notice the pairs of K2 also agree with each other very well. And of course, K1 is very different than K2, as you can see in these two equations. So uh, we designed that. This is the design that we have there, rendition of this one. And, and one of the interesting microwave engineering challenges, and you all appreciate this, is that we had to create a feedback under this structure such that when the wave is coming from here to here, it has a proper phase for two different frequencies. And when you actually excite the input function with the arbitrary input to each of those integral equation, the output, you wanna get it from here. So you don't want the wave to go back. You wanna wave go one way, kind of like, kind of like a, uh, you design Yagi Yuda antenna that the wave goes in one direction. We did something similar by choosing the pair of the antennas over here. We built it. These are the photographs that you see, you know, in the structure there. And we did the experiment. So experiment is very, very exciting because if you operate it at four gigahertz, you see different input. So this is the input one zero 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 one zero 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 one zero zero. So these are basically exciting monochromatic signal at each of those ports. And looking at the output, again, you notice there are six curves, each one of them, three pairs. And this shows the comparison of a theory and simulation. 
the first row is a theoretical result of the inverse of those four matrices that you see there. And it is the, the, the second row is the simulation results that coming from our Swiss cheese design that would operate at four, 4.5, five, and 5.5 gigahertz. And for each of these frequencies, it gives us you know, the inverse of that matrix we have. As I said, this is just a simulation and there's no experiment on this. Now, so what direction are we taking this work, by the way? So one of the directions we are taking it is to actually bring it into the near IR regime. The experiment we did was for 4.38 gigahertz and the other experiment that you saw was for four gigahertz and five gigahertz. But now we wanted to actually take it to the silicon photonics technology to 1.5 micron wavelength, telecommunication wavelength. This is in collaboration with my colleague, Professor Firuz Aflatuni. So we designed this Swiss cheese, but this time we designed it for 1.5 micron wavelength. So you notice this design is very, very small in size. This is about 30 micron. And this is about, you know, uh, 13, 14, 15 microns in this direction. This Swiss cheese, we, des uh, we designed it based on silicon technology. And the, the chip, the integrated chip has been prepared and is returned and now it's being tested in the laboratory of my friend, Professor Firuz Aflatuni. So we are very eager to see the experimental result of this. Uh, hopefully soon we will have the experimental result on this. But the early indication is that we are in the right direction. We'll see what it goes. Keep our fingers crossed to see how the experimental result of this look like. Another direction we are taking this work is by collaboration with a group of Professor Albert Pullman and Professor Andrew Alou. We are looking to see whether we can actually have a meta surface for open geometries. The geometries I've shown so far, the feedback is done by the waveguide. But here we would like to see whether we can actually have open structure by having meta surfaces, the Swiss cheese meta surfaces, and the semi transparent mirror. So we can see that what would happen if we actually send a distribution of the field and what comes out. Would that be solution to an integral equation? We'll see. This is work in progress going on. Another direction we are taking this is that can this idea of metamaterial can solve equation would be useful in inverse scattering problem. Now all of you are familiar with inverse scattering problem, which were very uh, interesting problem and involves integral equation. So if this Swiss cheese can solve integral equation, can be applied to inverse scattering problem. This is a work in progress. So the idea is that can we design a Swiss cheese that when you actually put uh, the, 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 the detected signal at this detector as an input, what comes out, could it be the distribution of the polarization distribution of the scatterers? Uh, this is actually a very ambitious goal we have to see whether this system can actually solve inverse scattering problem. Remains to be seen. This is, again, as I mentioned, is a work in progress with collaboration with my friend, Professor Ahmed Hurfa in Villanova University. And another direction is that, okay, so far, whatever I've said is that is the, is the coherent signal. In other words, we need to know magnitude and phase. But what would happen if we just care about the magnitude? In other words, what would happen if you have incoherent signals? That also we are working to see how we can actually create a structure that wouldn't care about the phase and only we care about the amplitude of that if we want to solve integral equation only in terms of you know, intensities not in terms of any complex numbers. And uh, one of the interesting direction also we are taking this is we are adding nonlinearity. Can we actually add nonlinearity and try to see whether we can actually expand the possibility of solving equation, not only for linear integral equation, but uh, hopefully also for the nonlinear uh, equation. This is work in progress and we are looking at the combination of nonlinear material and the combination of couplers MZI network. So, uh, this brings me to uh, our future vision in this field. What we are envisioning is that in the future, would it be possible to actually you print your own analog uh, computer in a sense? In other words, if we can actually have, uh, hopefully in the, in the sen sense of, you know, micron size, uh, to actually have a printed structure like this one that you can actually solve your integral equation. And after you're done, can it make it reconfigurable? One idea that we are thinking about for the future is to use the concept of phase change materials 
and to use like kind of like a remember we used to have laptops that had rewritable cds so could we use that type of technology to actually uh, print your uh, analog computer and then erase it later and print another one kind of like what we had in rewritable cds could we do that again this is something that we are hoping for the future but we are working towards that in that case you can imagine that you would have a collection of this several tens of micron size structure next to each other and as the wave goes through them not only the, in, the equation could be coupled equation but they can actually uh, feed each other and then after you solve your equation you can erase them and write them again anyway that's an interesting you know vision that we would like to pursue in the future now i promise to show you uh, also another platform that we are working on up to now whatever i said was designing a material that can do this interesting thing for us. But the question is, OK, if I design a material for a specific kernel, what if I want to change that kernel? Now, input would be arbitrary. I showed that you can have it any input you want when you design that the Swiss cheese for that kernel. But what if you also want to change the kernel? Can we actually have a changeable material, reconfigurable material? Yes, as I mentioned, one direction that we are thinking about is to have a phase change material. Phase change materials are materials that you know you can change them by introducing heat there, or by introducing you know laser pulses as rewritable CDs you know could do. But another path that we are pursuing is to actually use a completely different platform, not a material platform, but the platform of optical devices. And these are devices known as Mach Zender interferometer. Now, my good friend David Miller, uh, professor at Stanford University, several years ago, he came up with a very interesting idea. He said that if we consider a Mach Zender interferometer, so look at this is the uh, Mach Zender interferometer, which consists of a 50-50 uh, coupler over here, another 50-50 coupler, and two phase shifters over here. Uh, he showed that if you have a collection of these elements, collection of them, so imagine you make many of these and you connect them together. If you have a collection of these elements, each, ele each of these elements have two degrees of freedom. In other words, you can choose these phases in any way you want. He showed that if you can do that, you can have a collection of this Mach Zender, you can actually have an, any linear operator. In other words, you can have any linear, any matrix if you want. So that's quite exciting. And he uh, uh, reported it in this beautiful papers he has, you know, back about, you know, five, seven years ago. So we were inspired by his work. We said, OK, since we were doing the metal material for the Swiss cheese, why don't we consider our feedback system for MZI network? In other words, here, rather than putting a material that I showed you, we have done, what if we have a collection of these Mark Zender interferometer over here, but then create this feedback? Can we solve equations with this? So this is interesting. In other words, yes, again, we would like to design this equation uh, over here. And so there are advantages and constraints between this approach and the other approach that I presented to you. Uh, the advantage of this approach is that when you want to change the kernel, you can come over here and just change these phases. This is relatively easier than changing the material, obviously. But the advantage of the other technique that I showed you is much smaller footprint with respect to the wavelength. Here, this Mach Zender interferometer are rather long with respect to the wavelength. I'm talking about in the visible domain and in the near IR domain. So right now in my group, what we are doing is actually we are building these MZI networks using uh, uh, RF uh, circuits. So 45 megahertz circuit, we are designing this, uh, this uh, lot of these MZIs. And the goal is to connect them together and create the kernel you want. And then for any arbitrary input, you can solve your equation. And then when you're done with that class of equation, you can change the phases and have another kernel and solve another set of equations. So uh, the experimental work, by the way, is in progress. And because of the COVID-19, of course, the, the lockdown of the university, that has been delayed. So we are uh, uh, moving along with making those MZI structure. But let me show you some of our theoretical results while the experiment 
was going on, we wanted to actually uh, push the theoretical uh, things forward. So the idea is the following, that if I give you any matrix you want, you can create that matrix through this combination of three layers. One layer is that you have the input and you divide this input into equal input. Let's say this is three by three matrix as an example. And then each of these elements will come over here. And every one of these things that you see is one MZI that gives you the complex number of that matrix. So let's say if you have three by three matrix, you have nine complex numbers. So you see there are nine you know, boxes over here. In that case, you can create any matrix you want uh, and within certain constraint, of course, because then you have to make sure it's a passive and then you have some amplifiers over here and so on. I'd be happy to go through the details of that, but I just give you a big picture of this over here. And then you have these couplers that you have over here. And then when you have the input, this input come over here and becomes that mathematical operations over here and goes there. So in this one, we have theoretically so far shown that you're able to actually solve differential equations over here. And differential equations, even with the non-constant coefficients, so let's say you like to solve this differential equation with the non-constant coefficients. And uh, so in our simulation, and hopefully soon also in the future experiment when we are building this MZI now. So this one, I'm just showing you the, uh, the simulation result. We design a collection of MZI for the 11 by 11 uh, matrix, 11 element by 11 element matrix. And let's say, let's try to solve some of the known equations that we are familiar with. For example, Helmholtz equation. Okay, if I want to solve Helmholtz equation with this boundary conditions, then I have to put you know, uh, some of this function equal to zero. That will decide what would happen to all those MZIs and the phases of that. And that's what we did the simulation. So here's a comparison of a three result. One is the exact result that we expect from this equation, which of course is very well known to all of us, the uh, solution to Helmholtz equation. The, the, the red dot is if you use MATLAB matrix inversion and find what the solution should be. And the cross is the simulation result from our collection of MZI. You notice that that collection of MZI nicely actually gives us the, the solution to that Helmholtz equation. But of course, Helmholtz equation, we're all very familiar with. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. How about area equation? Well, area equation, of course, it has non-constant coefficients there. This one, again, if you actually compare uh, the exact result with the MATLAB generated result and with the simulation result from our MZI, that's what you get. And uh, then even Hermit equation. So in that case, you know, you have other interesting, you know, Parameters. Anyway, you can do it, by the way, uh, in other equations as well. These are just three uh, examples to see whether our system indeed can solve uh, this differential equation. So that brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank those members of my group who directly uh, significantly contributed to the result that I presented today. I'm very, very proud of them. Uh, I'm very thankful to their wonderful work. And I'd like to thank the funding agencies for providing source resources for us to do this work. And that brings me to the summary. Again, I would like to thank uh, my friends, you know, um, Professor Mohammed uh, Saidi, Professor Atman El Marabat, uh, Professor Sidik Yarman, uh, uh, Professor Youssef Zaz, and uh, Tibor Bercelli, and all of the people, you know, in MMS uh, for the kind invitation uh, to me to be part of it. It's always a pleasure and honor to be part of, you know, this conference. And uh, again, I would like to pay tribute to my uh, wonderful friend, uh, Professor Roberto Sorrentino, whom we lost uh, uh, in, in this past uh, few months. Uh, I dedicate this talk to his memory. Uh, his memory will stay with us uh, in our hearts and minds. And we, uh, we have him as our role model and we will continue our work following you know, his vision there. Thank you all very much. And I'd be happy to answer any question you have. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Nadar. It was a beautiful talk. Actually, you're turning our brain and, and we're uh, serious to considering your structures, whether we can do uh, any other operations uh, beyond what we have completed now. <clears throat> well, any, any questions at the first place from the audience, from the students? We have uh, a lot of attendees. Uh, <clears throat> 
Uh, let me just ask you a question. Sure. Uh, if, if there is, if there is none, let me ask the, uh, the, the, the floor. Any any questions uh, for, to Nader? Well, okay. Here is my question. Uh, sure. First, uh, you started with uh, with this uh, optical lens. Uh, yeah. Uh, you use this as a, a Fourier transformer, right? That's right. Uh, now, in communication business, as you know, we're using a lot of uh, Hilbert transformations. Yes, yeah. And, and the Hilbert transformation is very important uh, tool that uh, we really uh, try to implement this. Yes. On MATLAB and, 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 and even uh, using some uh, readily available uh, circuits. Now, uh, can we do it uh, with your uh, uh, technique? No, I, I, believe, I believe so. In principle, uh, Siddiq, you can do linear operators. Uh, right. Fourier transform is linear operator. You can do a Hilbert. I mean, we haven't done the Hilbert, but in principle, yes, that should be possible. And uh, uh, so the examples that we have shown over here, uh, for example, differentiation, integration, you know, integ the reason we went through that route, because as, as you know, I wanted to solve the integral equations. Yes, but... If you have other interesting operators that would be of application to specific area, like the one that you're mentioning it, I believe that should be possible as well. Let's talk offline. Let's see how we can design that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, so this is a very important issue. Lately, I have been uh, designing some uh, new invention we have. Uh, it's, a, it's a voice codec. Voice codecs are very important. Standard codecs. Don't do the business because everybody intercepts, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you know what I mean by that? And uh, I, we came up with a new idea. And mm -hmm. the codecs are being implemented by many uh, companies. Not many companies, just a few companies in the world. Yeah. And then um, it is like a transformation. Codec means you have a signal and you're dealing with the analog signals. And in the optical domain, maybe I can transform the voice to, uh, to an operator and the output is going to be, man, you can digitize the output of your uh, structure and, and yep. send it away. This is like encryption, equivalent of encryption. Maybe you can, you can just make a ciphering machine with these beautiful infrastructures uh, yes. that, and they are reconfigurable. Uh, yep. This is what you have invented lately. This is lovely. I, I love the, okay. part, uh, the, 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 the configurable. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, as long as uh, your operator is linear and so far, by the way, we have been looking at the linear operators. But as you notice, I show one slide that we are also looking at adding nonlinearity to this. Right. And that also is another project we have because we would like to expand this to see how the nonlinearity can play a role over here. But yes, if it's a linear operator in the system, yes, it should be doable. So, uh, yeah, I mean, the examples are welcome. If, if you're interested in Hilbert transform, we'll, we'll look into it to see how we can design a material that would do Hilbert transform. Mm -hmm. uh, we, by the way, uh, we have done uh, some uh, simulation for the, uh, for the uh, Henkel transform. I mean, not, it's a different one. Henkel transform. Yes, that also is possible. And uh, uh, just like, because we, we said, okay, the regular lens would do Fourier transform. But of course, regular lens is available. We don't want to do Fourier transform. That's already there. But can we do Hankel transform? Can we do Mellon transform? Uh, so we did try to look at the Hankel transform, and that's also is still possible. But you brought another interesting example, Hilbert transform. That's great. Yes. <laughs> just mention just one more thing uh, for sure. you. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, the power amplifier with the 5G, 6G, and the universal mobile telephone systems it's going to be very important. Uh, it's, it's all of the big fights. I mean, on the on the uh, on the world in the world, uh, the global yeah. fight. Who's going to do it? The Chinese or U.S. or the yeah. Europe? Okay. The idea is this. I mean, as far as the uh, the communication part of the business is concerned, high power amplifiers are quite important, and we're trying to squeeze the gallium nitride transistors to get the best out of it, the maximum yeah. power out of it, and that brings us to another near nonlinear region. In this case, in order to linearize in, in digital communication business, linearization is quite important. In this case, we're trying to find out some gadget, some tools to pre-distort uh, analogly I mean, the, 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 the signal using FPGA techniques and so on, so that we can generate the linear output. So mm -hmm. 
You understand what I mean by that? I know so, what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, uh, but uh, again, uh, as long as the part that you are referring to is linear, yes, that that can be applicable here. But I keep you posted of how the things are going in our project on nonlinear aspect of this. That's a work in progress. Because one of the reasons, by the way, uh, that we are very interested in the nonlinear aspect of this, but first we wanted to show the proof of concept for linear, obviously, is that some of these aspects of uh, optimization, like machine learning and so on and so forth, requires nonlinearity. I mean, that aspect of switching requires nonlinearity. So if you want to expand the range of the mathematical operation that this uh, idea can solve, we have to bring nonlinearity into play. And that's one of the reasons, you know, we are looking at the nonlinearity. Uh, but yes, I mean, in your example, if, if the part that you're referring to indeed requires a linear aspect, then this could be applicable to that. Let's talk offline. I would be interested to see how this thing can be connected to your interest. Thank you so much again. I'm going to uh, close this uh, session now. Uh, then, uh, uh, so we're going to go to the next uh, uh, session. Thank sure. you so much. By the way, I'd be happy to answer any question anyone has, by the way, later on. Please write to me, email, and I'd be happy to answer them. So, Otman, I turn it to you, okay? <laughs> Otman. All right. So, Manas is here. Welcome, Manos. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello. Great How to see you? you all. Hey, Nader, how are you? Hey, Luciano, Sidik. Hi, Manos. Hello. Otman, everybody. Great to see you all, even from Zoom. You know, that's the norm of the day. <laughs> yes, let's see everybody, yes. I would have loved to be there physically, but uh, hopefully you're going to have kind of a uh, makeup conference after COVID is over. Yes. <laughs> I look forward to that too. You're right. It would be great to be there in person. Yeah. Uh, I think the floor for, is for uh, Professor Luciano Tarricone. Okay. Okay. So uh, it is definitely a pleasure to me to introduce the next talk, uh, which is going to be given by Professor Manos Tenseris from the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering, Georgia Tech in the USA. The title is Inkjet 3D, 4D printed wireless ultra broadband modules for IoT, smart tag and smart cities applications. And uh, uh, let me now introduce uh, uh, Professor Manos Tenseris with some short notes about uh, his uh, bio. Uh, he was born and grew up in Piraeus, Greece, and graduated from Ionidios Model School of Piraeus in 1987 and received the diploma degree in electrical engineering and computer science, magna cum laude, from the National Technical University in Athens in Greece in 1992. Then a master degree and PhD degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of Michigan and Arbor in 1993 and 1998. He's currently a Ken Byers professor in the area of flexible electronics with the School of ECE at Georgia Tech and published more than 600 papers in reference journals and conference proceedings, several books, a lot of book chapters. And also he has served as the head of the Magnetic Technical Interest Group of the School of ECE in Georgia Tech. Uh, he has the an impressive variety and number of uh, roles. And uh, uh, he's uh, also the head of the Athena Research Group with 20 students and researchers. Uh, and uh, he's involved deeply in uh, several societies of the IEEE, especially MTT and uh, AP. He was the TPC chair for the IMS 2008 conference and the co-chair for the Athens 2009 symposium, uh, the general co-chair of the 2019 IEEE APS symposium in Atlanta and the chairman for the 2005 IEEE uh, CEMTD workshop. And also the chair of several subcommittees uh, and uh, too many things, <laughs> too, too long uh, your CV. Uh, That's okay. <laughs> Of course, he is a, a, a fellow of the IEEE and um, uh, an associate member of the European Microwave Association, a fellow of the Electromagnetic Academy, member of Commission D in the URSI, 
and uh, of the Technical Chamber of Greece. He was also the founder and chair of the newly formed IEEEM TTS TC24 uh, Committee on RFID Technology. So it's uh, really a great pleasure to me to introduce such an outstanding colleague and above all a very good friend. So uh, Manos, please, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. First of all, it has been, as I said, a great pleasure to meet you all even virtually. Uh, MMS has been one of my favorite conferences in the past and uh, I really appreciate the great job you are all doing. Uh, also, uh, this presentation is in memory of Professor Roberto Sorrentino. Uh, similar to what Nader said, uh, Roberto has been an uh, inspiration, a great role model for all of us. Uh, he has paved the path in uh, many uh, uh, directions for RF and microwave technology. And uh, we are all uh, very uh, honored and we had the pleasure to know him and be in friends with him. Uh, also, I would like to uh, appreciate uh, the great effort in putting together a very nice virtual program for MMS. And uh, here's my contact information, itengi.ec.gatec.edu, in case you would like to uh, ask any questions. Uh, my presentation will be uh, on uh, utilization of IT manufacturing to build up wireless ultra broadband modules for uh, 5G and beyond, Internet of Things, smart agriculture and smart city applications, uh, mainly focusing on uh, what we call uh, Cosmos or computational skins for multifunctional objects and systems. Uh, that's a term uh, we have uh, developed for a uh, future uh, scenario in a smart world. Uh, everything will feature some intelligence being realized, utilized in a 3D and uh, inkjet printing, definitely at the manufacturing. Scenario that will uh, rely on something we call computational skins. Uh, arrays of dense, high-performance uh, wireless network and ambiently powered computational nodes that will be embedded in everyday objects. So uh, thinking of uh, sensors or electronic modules being realized by uh, every material, uh, materials that are not optimized for electrical communications, materials like paper, plastic, fabrics, uh, similar to this one, for example, sticky notes, smart food packaging, smart fabrics to sense biosignals, sweat, heart rate, posture, and so on, uh, tissues, floors and walls, even uh, monitoring or sensing of pathogens like COVID. Uh, that means devices that will be autonomous and still will be capable of very, very sensitive detection uh, while being interrogated at very large distances. If we think uh, about the evolution of technologies over the last 20 years, uh, we started for a planar, low complexity print wireboards. And then in the late 90s, people started utilizing the third dimension, utilizing low temperature cofar ceramic. Uh, early 2000s, people started investigating flexible configurations, uh, utilizing flexible components like liquid crystal polymer. Uh, and now people have uh, started routinely realizing electronics, utilizing PET, Kapton, paper, fabric, glass, uh, while functions such as 3D integration, MEMS integration, thermal solutions and integration of nanostructures has been quite routinely. Uh, one technology or one set of applications that has uh, pushed tremendously uh, the performance of uh, uh, printable wireless electronics has been the development of 5G network. Uh, 5G and 5G plus, ours we call B5G, beyond 5G networks. Uh, that have enabled ultra fast, ultra broadband communication by just taking advantage of much broader frequencies. Uh, there is discussion about generalized use of millimeter wave frequencies, 28 to 40 at least, if not 60, 
in addition to the conventional frequencies uh, being utilized all the way up to LTE. So um, just an example, this technology allows, uh, allows for area traffic capacity two orders of magnitude better than uh, 4G or uh, connection density 10 times, network energy efficiency 100 times at a very mobile configuration as well. Uh, while spectrum efficiency is also at least tripled. And that has allowed the implementation of uh, large scale uh, wireless sensor networks. Uh, networks that will have uh, hundreds, thousands, even millions of uh, elements in very small area, uh, allowing to have the first demonstrations of machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, uh, autonomous cars. We are already at class two to class three autonomy. Definitely will take some time to go to class five full autonomy of cars, but still we're moving. Uh, wearable devices, very, very capable. And then a uh, very efficient coverage of customized experience for everybody. So slowly we're getting into a world of internet of things with very disparate devices. Devices are very different in terms of uh, power consumption, in terms of size, in terms of uh, data rates. Uh, devices going all the way from the simple RFIDs or RFID enabled sensors to some network data carriers and all the way up to the physical interface zone, all of them having to communicate with gateways that have to have a very good, a very uniform, uh, ubiquitous operability with as little as possible of energy. And then being able to upload this onto some uh, form of a cloud, I we'll call it like internet plus, which will lead to some processing of the data and maybe some on the fly reorganization uh, very efficiently. So to allow to have this uh, very large number of uh, nodes, of modules, uh, additive technologies have grown up. And uh, if you look at here, the dark blue are the uh, conventional subtractive technologies, the bottom ones are the active technologies. And as you can see, inkjet printing and also aerosol printing, which has similar properties, uh, feature size is now very close to a uh, one micron, which allows all a realization of structures at least up to millimeter wave. Uh, in our lab, we have realized even polarizers in terahertz frequency range utilizing inkjet printing, but mostly in this uh, talk, I will focus below 100 gigahertz. Multi-layer has been quite possible. Multiple layers of dielectrics, multiple layers of arbitrary orientations in a very fast speed. There's no need of uh, uh, time consuming fabrication, no need of masks, uh, negligible waste, and the area is unlimited. So I would say talking about maturity has uh, grown tremendously over the last 10 years. Obviously you cannot compete with photolithography, which has a feature size in uh, nanometers. But uh, I would say uh, in terms, let's say, of uh, million laser ablation and so on, uh, these structures, these techniques are very, very uh, efficient, very, very low cost, and maybe the most appropriate for a scale up of operation. So if you think in terms of the uh, platforms, if you think in terms of uh, how we visualize uh, the wireless modules of the future to be. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that's the example. Uh, schematic shown here uh, shows three fundamental functions, as we call the tricorder operability. Uh, communication capability, sensing capability, and also power management. And all of these have to take place maybe by reutilizing or multitasking components of your module. For example, an antenna, uh, can be utilized for a fraction of the time as a sensing mechanism, but just monitoring either change in frequency or a change in amount of reflected power for backscatter nodes. Uh, it can do a very effective quote, quote, sensing operability. 
then uh, for another fraction of the time, uh, it could communicate the data to the gateway. And then for uh, the final, for the rest of your time, uh, this antenna could be utilized to harvest energy from the environment. And then throughout some efficient power management, uh, store it and keep it for the next cycle of operability. Uh, two interfaces, uh, one wireless interface for communication sensing power. The other has to be an interface for something we call electronic interface to uh, nanostructures. Nanostructures being operated as functionalized, let's say, uh, sensors, energy harvesters, and battery. Uh, the problem is uh, there are more and more requirements that you have to satisfy. Uh, one is the range. Typically, whenever you have uh, IoT implementations, uh, range, especially for passive devices, is quite low. And what I will uh, show here is ways you can have uh, double digit or even triple digit range for uh, semi-passive implementations, miniaturization. Uh, you want all of these devices to be uh, as little intrusive as possible, especially for wearable applications or smart house applications. Data rate, uh, most of the times for RFID enabled structures, People are talking about kilobit per second or megabit per second, but uh, especially for bio applications or uh, fast sensors, we may need gigabit per second. Integrability is very important while, as well as mass scalability. In addition to this, uh, we're talking about uh, mass scale implementation. So self-monitoring or self-diagnostics are going to be extremely important. Uh, there's no way somebody can uh, test, can check the integrity of millions of sensors regularly. So there is the need of something we call smart packaging. Uh, packaging that can do the self-sensing, self-monitoring, even self-healing if possible, in order to extend the lifetime of these modules. Uh, it would be great if they would be flexible to be attached on arbitrary surfaces, autonomous, uh, have the capability to resolve uh, nearby uh, nodes quite effectively while being secure and immune to EMI or uh, counterfeiting. And actually the artificial intelligence has, has been the key enabler uh, to uh, be able to push the range and also to enhance the uh, resolution and the readability of these type of structures. Uh, decision trees approach uh, is a widely used method based on the form of this tree structure, if it's well known in advance, and that's suitable for a non-parametric model with no assumptions. We have figured out that uh, decision tree uh, has been quite effective with arbitrary uh, placement of uh, nodes, especially in indoor environments. Now, on the other side, if we have some prior information uh, or we have, let's say, some uh, extensive set of uh, preliminary simulations or uh, demonstrations to train your system, the K nearest neighbor, or KNN, uh, has been uh, quite effective. Simple instance-based learning for prospective statistical classification. Uh, for input variables, uh, you uh, train and utilize the Euclidean distance. And uh, we have figured out using this uh, approach as an example, uh, we have improved uh, readability of uh, RFID tags uh, by 90%. Uh, we have improved detection of arbitrary objects utilizing wireless power by three orders of magnitude. And uh, also we have improved the efficiency of a wireless power transfer systems due to misalignment by uh, 30 to 40 percent. So I believe artificial intelligence is going to be a game changer. And then the other game changer is the IT manufacturing technologies. Uh, technologies combining uh, 3D printing with inkjet or uh, inkjet printing or even aerosol printing to come up with structures not been uh, possible uh, before.
Uh, you see here, for example, one biconical porous antenna operating as a multi-parameter sensor. Uh, the pore size, pore density can be effectively controlled as well as uh, the material you can deposit on each one of these pores. Uh, allowing this to be uh, theoretically a sensor that can sense as many parameters as the pores. Practically, we have utilized this pores by conical antenna uh, to detect uh, five or six parameters simultaneously. Now, utilizing this, you can print anything from uh, substrates, masks, metal traces, uh, complex structures in all 3D uh, implementations, and then effectively come up with any configuration you could realize with uh, conventional fabrication techniques, plus very new configurations. Uh, for instance, printing, uh, we have managed to print polymer solutions, uh, metals, carbon nanomaterial suspensions to realize fully 3D interconnects, RF substrates or attached dyes. And with 3D, uh, which is, I would say, INGZIT has to do with the fine details, 3D has to do with the uh, uh, more bulk details, uh, photoactive resins, thermoplastics, ceramics, conductives to come up with new generation of dielectric lenses smart encapsulations and dye embedded LED frames. Uh, very, uh, I would say the whole uh, field started about uh, five to seven uh, years in terms of millimeter wave implementations. Uh, initially addressing the need for on packets, in packets antennas, that's a 30 gigahertz patch antenna print directly onto chip molding and then print in vertical interconnect, uh, flexible Yagiuda antenna arrays uh, with a wrench broadband uh, feeding mechanism, uh, and then proximity coupled patch arrays for phase array implementations where we needed to pattern the substrate to minimize interference. Here you can print the feeding, you can uh, print uh, effectively 3D cavities of arbitrary shapes below the resonators and then the resonators themselves. Uh, here you see one example for 5G broadband packets integrated antennas uh, that uh, fabricate the prototype of antennas covering 30% uh, of the fractional bandwidth, 22 to 30 gigahertz. There are antennas covering all the way up to 22 to 40 gigahertz. I could send you more information. And uh, in this case, and I would like to stress this schematic here, uh, you can very effectively integrate it ICs of different size or thickness. You can come up with uh, slanted vertical interconnects to minimize inductive uh, parasitic. Uh, you can uh, print very effectively in the integrated uh, thermal management solutions, like these thermal VS arrays. And then on top, you can have passive components, antenna, filter, and balloon coming up with a module effectively instantly uh, utilizing very, very low temperatures. We are talking about temperatures below 100 for curing uh, and sintering as well. Uh, you see another example here I was uh, talking before, that's one uh, module on uh, glass, uh, which is covering 24 to 40 gigahertz, about 50% bandwidth realized gain for DBI. Uh, the structures uh, were printed uh, here. Uh, more or less, uh, you have printed the reflectors and then you have integrated artifices uh, within the core. You have antennas on the top. Uh, you can have this attached through BGA and uh, these antennas are very reliable. That's a very reliable antenna array. Uh, and uh, that's a quite miniaturized, 0.25 lambda naught by 0.45 lambda naught element size uh, that can be effectively printed on the top of the rest of the module. Uh, just to show, uh, the level of uh, complexity and integration the printed modules have reached today. Uh, here I'm showing the different uh, fabrication process to come up uh, 
uh, with uh, a 5G uh, beacon with energy harvesting capability. Uh, in a sense, you can print the substrate with cavities, inkjet print some SUA to planarize, inkjet print conductive traces where you want, uh, fabricate the via by metallizing the bottom, uh, flip chip or attaching cavities the ICs, fill the cavity, which could be trapezoidal, spherical, oblong, and so on. Inkjet print some SU8 for planarizing and the antenna. And here you go. You, you have a whole module operating at 28 gigahertz, uh, including ICs, antennas, diodes, printed RAMs for interconnection, printed cavity, and embedded energy harvester uh, in some uh, flexible configuration. Uh, one of the main questions in the past has been how to integrate, how to attach the ICs in this type of printed substrates. And uh, in order to uh, mitigate losses from conventional configurations, also uh, all of the structures, most of the structures have to be uh, bent sometimes or very conformal. And that's how we have come up with two ways. One is the surface mount where you can utilize printed ramp interconnects from the surface of the substrate to the top of the MMIC and down. And this one reduces significantly the parasitics from typical time consuming and costly bond wires and ribbons and also cavity embedded. So you can print a cavity, attach the IC, fill the gap, and then have some horizontal interconnects in order to attach the ICs. And that's how if you look here, you can come up with the whole module. So initially you have the matching section here to the load IC, uh, you attach the diode for the uh, harvesting, the load here, fill the cavity, you print the antennas, and that's how you have the beacon. Uh, all of this was done with SLA 3D and Inkzip printer. I have to stress that the uh, facilities needed to realize this are extremely low cost. Uh, SLA 3D printer is, let's say, 2, 3K. Inkjet printer is quite low cost. So effectively, we're moving to an era of realizing quite complicated uh, modules literally at home. Uh, that's an example, uh, let's say 0.9 volt output voltage, harvest at 20 centimeter range with 59 dBm ARP. Uh, that's a schematic. Uh, so in all the components of this and the operability, uh, more or less, we have no external circuitry or power storage. Batteries are something we don't like for IoT. So if you can operate completely on harvested energy, that's going to be uh, quite significant. Uh, and that's uh, literally an autonomous tag and sensor. Um, now let's move to multi-chip modules, because that's another idea uh, that has gained lots of steam over the last uh, year. Uh, here, you see everything being printed except from the IC. So cavity board, 3D printing, exit printed, PCB layer. Uh, MMIC a bypass caps are going to be attached on exit die attached cavity, uh, exit gap fill, to fill the gaps in the cavity you have printed, printed interconnects, 3D printing the encapsulant, and then adding intelligence to your encapsulant. Uh, as we said, you want to have now a package that's not just a plastic cup or a metal cup. You want to add functionality. Here you see an exit printed frequency selective surface. And that's something you can see here. So more or less, you see suppression of the interference at 23 gigahertz. Uh, very good isolation. And uh, this one can be scaled to different sizes of multi-chip modules. Another idea that has uh, grown up lately is something we call system on antenna. So uh, in a sense, this idea uh, allows for the realization of modules that are limited only by the size of antenna. Uh, here you see a 3D printed horn antenna uh, with some pre-printed cavities where you can integrate uh, VCO PA for the transmitter, 
uh, uh, V-tune VCA to PA transmitter, and also you could have the receiver on the other side. Uh, you see here the integration of the ICs, uh, and that's limited only by the size of the side of your horn. You do not need any complicated module. This can be done even more miniaturized. If you print the horn on some flexible substrate, and then you integrate the cavities, uh, you are going to be able to uh, question that. Now you see uh, the performance nearly identical to a simulated horn antenna. Uh, you can see very effectively the frequency shift with VCO tunability. Uh, you can see the operability for the different frequencies. Now, another idea we, um, we have found is facilitated tremendously utilizing 3D printing is uh, functional encapsulants. Uh, that you can print directly onto PCBs or dice, uh, either uh, microfluidics, microfluidics with uh, uh, some uh, conventional liquids or liquid metals like Galinstan. You can have embedded through mold vias. Uh, here you see a pyramidal or trapezoidal uh, ramp interconnect. And uh, you can do it literally on uh, different materials, rigid acrylate, flexible ceramic composite. Uh, another interesting point uh, has to do with uh, energy autonomy. We discussed before that it's very, very important to have really autonomous operation, harvesting energy. But uh, somebody could claim, especially for uh, RF energy, uh, the sources, the source position or the source alignment uh, change uh, throughout the time. So uh, somebody might claim that uh, harvesting would work better for different times of the day, different directions and so on. So it's very important to have the capability of harvesting energy uh, in an agnostic way. Uh, that means uh, no matter what's relative orientation, no matter what's the time of the day, no matter what's the environment, your module should be able to collect uh, the optimum amount of power. And we figure out we can do that uh, utilizing printed Rotman lens shown here. Now that's a typical uh, rectification system, eight rectifiers with direct DC combining, which is given some amount of power. I mean, if you see, possibly you need to have at least zero dBm per centimeter square uh, to have 0.05 output voltage. Now, utilizing uh, this uh, printed lens for all of the systems, the printed Rotman lens with multiple outputs means you can get uh, power from all these different directions and now let's say 360 degrees, and that can be realized even in three dimensions to have four pi steroids, but let's say uh, 360 degrees, and you can see that you can start having a very efficient voltage and power much earlier. In a sense, 20 times improvement on the uh, harvested power, uh, which means uh, you are talking uh, for conversion of a uh, much better uh, amount of power for this type of systems. Now, another uh, very interesting idea uh, has to do with miniaturization, or as we call the uh, on-demand transforming uh, capability. And uh, that has been made possible also utilizing uh, IT manufacturing and taking advantage of origami and kirigami uh, technologies. Uh, here you see uh, a 3D printed uh, origami antenna structure that's made of this fundamental unit cell that's a printed folded dipole with kirigami cuts to allow flexibility. Uh, that's the fold line and the stress release gaps. And utilizing this type of accordion folding or unfolding, you can see some quite efficient uh, tunability 
of your frequent selective surface. Uh, you can see something from 21 to 24, uh, very broad band tunability and very good uh, mechanical performance. Uh, you see here for conventional substrates, uh, you have bending uh, from uh, 200 grams. Here with 400 grams still, it's uh, very sturdy. Uh, just come back to the uh, ramp interconnect. Uh, I want to stress, this one is the, maybe the easiest printable interconnect that would allow you to flex, have flexible hybrid electronics. Uh, that's an example here on glass uh, with four CPW ramp interconnects. Uh, this one would go anywhere from uh, 510 to 60 degrees. Uh, you have inductance half of a typical wire bond that's very sturdy. Uh, you can flex it, you can twist it. This one could keep your IC integrated. And that can be done even for active devices. You see an LNA MMIC uh, as received, attach on board, you print dielectric scaffolding, you print metal interconnects, here you go. Uh, that's the profile uh, scan of uh, printed RF out RAM. Uh, and you connect your IC quite effectively without the need of wire, bond, of wire bonds or ribbons. Uh, uh, also, we can do the same thing for cavity embedded devices, really complicated ones. That's a cavity embedded KA band LNA, uh, typically connected with ribbon bonds, uh, which are very difficult to replicate. Uh, you have to be very careful not to lose attachment. Here, you just print the electric scaffolding, print the metal ramp, uh, and you have reduced interconnect, better performance, uh, even better than the ribbon bond, as you can see here. Uh, just a simple example of uh, a broadband 5G uh, bow tie antenna system on uh, glass uh, printed bow tie antennas, ramp interconnects covering the whole frequency range. Uh, utilizing this, you can have reconfigurable uh, subset integrated waveguides that can be utilized for uh, water quality monitoring. Uh, or biomonitoring by just uh, printing microfluidics into flexible substrates. Here it's a strain sensing hollow cube where inside this cube you have a hollow trapezoidal cavity that can detect directional strain and that's a Vivaldi antenna array. Just one idea of uh, the capabilities of the origami we discussed before with 3D collapsible reflector. You start with planar and then utilizing origami folding you can come up with fully 3D reflector without having an issue of size to transfer it and so on. I would like to uh, spend a little bit more time on something we call the compressible or affordable antenna array, or as we call origami tree. Uh, that's fully 3D printed. Uh, what you can do is first, you can print some supporting porous structure, we call it Voronoi structure. That means a structure with controlled uh, set of uh, holes, uh, which controls the stiffness. Uh, then we have printed the helical antenna and a zigzag antenna microfluidic channel. You can fill with uh, metal liquid inside. This one is very easily compressible, uh, and you may integrate multiple 3D antennas quite effectively here. Uh, the whole idea is utilizing the origami, uh, the uh, origami Voronoi structures for scaffolding. You can very effectively have mechanical tuning, uh, controlling your tuning range and also uh, your uh, compression uh, properties. And that's some examples of the different properties for polarization, frequency, and so on. We have demonstrated something similar also in European microwave that was supposed to take place in Utrecht. Uh, we'll post a video with some uh, origami-based reconfiguration of uh, two polarizations at the same time. Uh, another example of uh, origami self-reconfiguring uh, RF modules is shown here. Uh, you can print antennas on two sides 
and then based on the application of a stimulus, either heat or RF uh, pilot or activating signal, this structure will start folding even in the form of a cube or some pyramid or trapezoid. Uh, in this way, you can minimize interference. So instead of having blocking effects, if you place a metal on top of these two sides, here you have two sides perpendicular to each other, uh, very minimal blocking and taking advantage of uh, multipath propagation. Again, it's simple. Uh, you could print hinges here that would allow to fold. And then uh, even with thermal treatment, 50, 60 degrees, you could fold and unfold repeatedly to uh, come up with some uh, shape you would like to. Uh, you see here the performance of some of the 3D printed materials are uh, quite broadband, same dielectric constant all the way up to 90 gigahertz. Some people claim that uh, most of the 3D printed materials are lossy. And uh, that's true for most of the times. Uh, nevertheless, over the last year, uh, there have been demonstrations of PCB-like materials, printed materials, with lost tangent in the order of 5, 10, minus 3 or less. So slowly, we're moving to very low loss materials, even for applications going up to the E-band, 60, 90 gigahertz. Just some more examples of flexible microfluidic sensors. Uh, they're twistable squeezable uh, waveguides, and they can be fully customized. Uh, microfluidics can be 3D printed, uh, utilizing uh, uh, some uh, PMMA, uh, and then removing the material from the channel area, you may very easily define. And in this case, you may come up with truly 3D microfluidic configurations, not possible with conventional techniques. Here you see the cross section of a 5G uh, module uh, with a high power PA. You see some optimized uh, heat abduction path uh, with a 3D microfluidic configuration below it, I see. And also here you see an example of a blood uh, analyzer with double lambda interlaced printed uh, microfluidic channels. Uh, you can mix liquids quite effectively if you want to monitor quality of life. And all of this can be done uh, utilizing SU8 and PMMA, nothing special. Uh, you remove the PMMA, you wash out the PMMA, and then you can come up with a very effective channel. So this way was possible to come up with uh, smart strips doing sensing of multiple parameters. Uh, here you see uh, two of them. Uh, that's the liquid inlet, electrical sensors for standalone microfluidics, antenna, chemical sensors for paper microfluidics. So in a sense, you take advantage of both standalone and paper microfluidics, and you may interrogate utilizing RFID technologies, as it's shown here. You may have lots of them. That's a cross-section of standalone microfluidics, and that's the paper microfluidics, and that's a removable part. So you may maintain the uh, same platform for uh, the RFID detection and interrogation, and you may peel off the disposable uh, sensing part and replace with a new one. Uh, that's another uh, set of floating sensors we call to uh, monitor uh, water reservoirs as well as oil and gas contamination. Uh, spherical, a fully printable uh, set of four patches, each one subtending 90 degrees and connected to phase delay lines, liquid channel to do the sampling and weight adjusting. Uh, and here you see uh, the properties for the communication, only in five, maximum 60 theta degrees. Uh, we discussed before about on packets, 30 gigahertz antenna, fully printed on top of this and operating very effectively at 30 gigahertz without any detuning. 
Uh, I would like to stress this slide, which uh, stressed the capabilities of backscattering, millimeter wave backscattering, to go all the way about gigabit per second by just utilizing a gigabit bias, uh, flexible substrate on low loss. We have come up with the first gigabit backscatter data rates larger than four gigabit per second for extreme energy efficiency less than 0.15 picojoules per bit, which is three, four orders of magnitude, better than uh, state of the art of RFIDs. Very important uh, for smart agriculture. Let's say you have large uh, orchards and you want to monitor uh, the uh, weather conditions. You want to monitor humidity, you want temperature, you want to monitor uh, the uh, minerals in the soil. Utilizing this type of back scatters, you can have a 24 seven monitoring of this and optimization of your crops. And to just so that you can even uh, modulate your structures that's back scattered OFDM. Now we said before, one of the main issue for the uh, additively manufactured IOT systems has to do with the range. And uh, typically they are close to a meter or low single digit uh, ranges. So uh, one of the main ideas was how we could push it, how we could increase the read range without any issue. And uh, the idea we came up with was, was utilizing reflector rays. Reflector rays, and especially Vanata reflector rays, has been a principle that has been uh, around quite some time, not been used though for this type of structures. So the instant wave is reflected in the same direction uh, with orthogonal polarization to minimize the interference. Now, uh, it's important because you could have arbitrarily higher CS, which is almost angle independent monostatic response. Uh, and also cross-polarized response minimizes the interference. But on the other side, you take advantage of the reader system in these frequencies, millimeter wave, which is like high frequency operable, high gain reader antennas and narrow beam width. And that's how we came up with angle independent reading ranges in excess of one kilometer instead of one to five meters. Extremely high clutter induced interference isolation and very compact. Uh, here you see one uh, printed uh, module shown here. That's uh, Vanata, uh, that's where you place the sensor, that's the oscillator and you take the energy from your solar cell. Uh, here at least 200 microwatts, but the latest version is about 18 to 20 microwatts. This one is the reflector I discussed before. Now, uh, you integration of any sensor, dust sensor, chemical sensor, temperature, humidity sensor is a no brainer. You just attach it here, utilizing a cavity or a ramp we discussed before. And then you have great resolution below 0.5 microns. So uh, we uh, have come up with something we call the internet of skins. Uh, effectively utilizing, combining this approach we, um, we can address the six fundamental challenges of IoT modules. And I believe that something may be very interesting for the uh, future students all over the world to further uh, work on, further improve. One is uh, flexible devices, the realization of uh, truly wireless high sensitivity sensors on uh, flexible devices. Uh, ultra low power below 20 microwatts. Battery less operability, you don't need any battery. You can just utilize energy harvesting, utilizing printed solar cells, printed uh, RF harvesters, print piezo. Long range, 250 meters to one kilometer. Uh, localizable in real time, very important whenever you have millions of them existing. And doing that with a single reader, uh, being able to localize angle of arrival and range, and then metal mounting compatibility. Uh, that's an example for different uh, tags being placed on a room. Uh, that's an example for the humidity sensor. And you can see how cluttered the environment is. That's a really tiny uh, credit card size uh, RFID tag uh, shown here. And that's the measurement. And over a range of 140 degrees variation of the angle of instance of the signal of an interrogator. 
the RCS change is only by 10 dBs. And that's very important because you don't need to have the reader aligned with your tag. Now, uh, and that's another practical example of 90 meter outdoors, uh, 20 microwatts, autonomous. Uh, that's like uh, the distance of this tiny uh, credit card zone here, to, all the way up to 250 meters. Now, um, another idea we tested utilizing this type of fully printed autonomous modules was something we call the electronic nose or multi-gas detection. And uh, who can do that? Because you may integrate sensors, multiple sensors on the same platform. Here you see uh, sensing uh, utilizing CNT, PABS, HFA, resistive, and P, and P PSS. Uh, to monitor humidity, temperature, ammonia, and organophosphate, nerve agent, or fertilizer. So uh, you can utilize humidity temperature for self-calibration. And then you could have very effectively in a uh, time below a minute, some readings of different gases or different uh, substrates. And here's an example of localizing in space with a single reader with centimeter accuracy. Uh, pretty much that's what we discussed before. We call it 5G RFID or the Internet of Skins. Uh, one item I would like to stress is uh, pretty soon we plan to demonstrate uh, some non line of sight interrogation of RFIDs. Uh, that's another question sometimes for cluttered environments, inventories, uh, or uh, smart city configurations. But uh, there are approaches that can help alleviate that. Uh, that's an RFID enabled electronic nose. That's the principle to allow for gas detection, wireless gas sensor. Just want to show how simple the uh, principle is for the detection. You could have a gap, uh, more or less you print two antennas, you print lines, and then you have either a gap or interdigitated configuration with variable gap here, where you can deposit your functionalizing agent. Then by just uh, sensing some parameter, maybe let's say uh, uh, ammonia past its own here, what you are doing is you are changing the real and the imaginary part of the impedance in between here. Now the change of the imaginary part leads to a shift of the resonant frequency. See here from 850 going all the way up to 925. And then the change of the real part uh, modifies the amount of reflected power. And that's quite significant because you have two degrees of freedom uh, to detect this type of systems. Here is one example of the indigitated sensor we discussed before, but just deposit in uh, RGO. And uh, also you may uh, add pores or change the effective area quite effectively. And that's another of the advantages of the manufacturing. You don't have a simple deposition of electrodes, but you may control uh, the uh, porosity in order to increase, to enhance the sensitivity, even for this very simple structure. You see, for example, sensitivity went up from uh, 8% to uh, almost 50%. Uh, by just changing the porosity and the gold electrodes. And uh, I'm getting pretty much close to the close of the talk. I would like to stress uh, two or three examples for wearable uh, and practical applications. Here is a wearable energy harvester, autonomous sensing network. So let's say you have some wearable sensors uh, that need to be communicated to some reader, software defined radio, maybe in a hospital or some uh, senior assisted living and so on. And uh, one of the main issue is uh, most of the sensors typically require batteries. Uh, the question is, can you harvest energy from handheld devices to uh, interrogate passive sensors and then transmit to the software defined radio reader? Let's say uh, you hold some work talk of 464 megahertz, and then you have a rectifier that's printed and that can convert to DC and also to the second harmonic being utilized to interrogate the sensors, receive the data, 
and then processing your gateway that will collect the data and transmit to your software defined radio. Uh, second example has to do with uh, soil moisture and leaf wetness sensor. Uh, that, uh, that includes two engine printed sensors for humidity, uh, for rainfall and frost detection and soil moisture sensor. This one could have also functionalized fingers for minerals. Then you have a microcontroller which can be printed on some printed uh, PCB or even flexible PCB anymore. And then connect it to these, uh, these two antennas. One is the uh, short, the, the long S antenna harvesting energy from the local TV stations. And then this short monopole which could utilize the uh, gateway, transmit the data and transmit to some reader. You can place it pretty much anywhere there are TV signals and you could have a monitoring of the uh, farming field quite effectively. Uh, with, uh, with this, uh, I would like to, uh, to, close, to close the presentation uh, with a couple of conclusions. Uh, up to now, uh, IoT manufacturing has been uh, quite effective in addressing uh, many different issues. Issues having to do with uh, complicated systems, complicated uh, modules, uh, minimizing the effect of flexing, flexible hybrid electronics, uh, and being able to uh, have uh, on-demand uh, mass-scale manufacturing. Uh, there are issues. There are issues having to do with uh, printing of active devices. Still, uh, there are numerous efforts to do that for high frequencies. There are issues having to do with uh, powering. And there are issues having to do with moving this technology all the way up to the optical frequencies. Still, over the last decade, uh, we have come through a very long distance. Uh, already modules all the way up to 5G millimeter wave have started getting demonstrated and fully printed uh, for communications, sensors, and radars. But definitely, there are lots of areas of research uh, that can uh, further improve. I believe we have seen only the tip of the iceberg. And the main reason is, I believe that uh, almost all of us, apart from the new PhD or master students, have been trained to think in 2.5D. So talking about 3D, we assume you have multiple PCB, PCB boards, one placed on top of each other. I believe the new uh, generation of structures will be fully 3D. Fully 3D, maybe spherical, uh, maybe trapezoidal, and also self-reconfiguring uh, modules. Modules that will shape their shape, that will change their shapes for different environments. Going from flat to a cube, to pyramid and so on to uh, readjust. So uh, again, thanks very much uh, for uh, allowing me to give this talk. Uh, feel free to uh, contact me at the email and I will also be very happy to answer questions uh, you may have about this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manos, for your very inspiring presentation. It was extremely interesting and full of uh, uh, new and uh, outstanding applications. So thank you once again. And uh, of course, there is time for some questions from the audience. Oh, Manos, uh, oh, OK. Uh, <clears throat> just forgive my ignorance. I think uh, I really appreciated your presentation. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was talking to my PhD student regarding whether we can use uh, printed uh, 3D printers to print our microwave circuit. And I said to him, like, uh, look, uh, this is really, it may be tough. Uh, but 3D printing is okay, but the process is quite important. And the quality that you're going to be printing, like the conducting surfaces and etc. So I have no knowledge about this, but it looks like that you've done a lot and you have accomplished a lot. So would you give me some information? Uh, how do you spray or, or, or 
uh, put your conductors, your conducting surfaces like a 3D antennas and, and the, the horn antennas and the, and the uh, substrate. So do you develop the substrate? Then do you spray the uh, conductors uh, on, the, uh, on the substrate? How do you do that? Uh, yes. so, 3D printers, that's why I'm asking this question to you. That's, that's a very good question. And uh, the answer is that there are three important steps on this. Number one is the surface roughness. And typically whenever you have 3D printed substrates, roughness is not minimal. There are cases where you have roughness in excess of 20 to 30 micron, even more. So uh, if you utilize some, let's say, uh, materials uh, that have significant roughness, what we're doing is we're inkjet printing a very thin layer of SU-8. So you planarize this, utilizing SU-8. In this case, the roughness goes to, uh, goes below one micron. We have seen if you print a very thin film of SU-8, uh, maybe let's say 10 micron and so on, you're talking about roughness of uh, uh, 100 to 500 nanometers, which allows very uniform deposition. Uh, the second is whenever you uh, deposit your uh, conductors, I don't know if it's gonna be uh, silver, gold, or even uh, some copper bath, because there are different ways of doing this. You can deposit silver inks, you can deposit gold inks, or you may print some uh, catalyst and then you may dip it into some copper bath and you can do plateless deposition. So it depends on what you want to do. Uh, it's very important to have uh, printing in some interlaced configuration. One of the common mistakes people are doing is they think that by just printing serially, so drop, drop, drop along a line and then go drop, drop, drop along a second line and so on, that works. And the answer is what we have seen, that doesn't work because you have something we call splashing on the substrate. And that means you have uh, hills and valleys on your uh, circuit, uh, reducing the conductivity, maybe one, maybe two to three orders of magnitude. So what you do is whenever you print, you do something we call interlaced printing. So you print uh, a droplet left, then a droplet uh, right half a step ahead and you go zigzag. And if you do like the zigzag printing, you can have a conductivity which is, I would say 10% uh, of the bulk conductivity. And then the curing or the sintering as we call it is going to be quite significant. Uh, so you have to have a ramp profile. And if you do it uh, effectively, you can have some conductivity which is, I would say one half to one third of the bulk, which is okay. So for example, if you have uh, copper instead of 5.8 10 to the seventh Siemens per meter, you have a conductivity of two to three 10 to the seventh Siemens per meter. But I would say these are the three steps you have to keep in mind. One is planarizing, reducing surface roughness. The second is printing correctly with a zigzag configuration. And the third is sintering with a ramp profile. And then you're gonna be okay. You're gonna have very effective uh, spray. Typical uh, quantity, I would say it could be a one picoliter droplet. And uh, the angle of printing should be uh, anything between 70 to 110 degrees. I can give more details to your students or to you if you want. I can hook you up with my senior PhD students and we can give you the recipes, definitely. This is not, uh, I mean, you, you were also talking about like uh, spending two, three thousand dollars for uh, for a typical uh, 3D printer. Yeah. Exactly. You, you do this metal deposition with three thousand dollars. Yeah, you can do it. You can do like the metal deposition with inkjet printer. You you have inkjet printers, so more or less you can modify inkjet printers, conventional ones. You can buy from uh, from the computer store. So there are ways to modify this. Possibly, maybe let's say two three thousand uh, dollars, and you could have a resolution. I would say uh, eighty to hundred micron. Okay, if you want to buy a more accurate one, let's say for one, one micron, you may buy the Matics for 20,000, but that's not like 1 million. So it's either 20,000 for one to 10 micro resolution or conventional computer ink the printer if you want to have 80 to 100 micron, which is okay for uh, applications below 10 gig. 
So all infrastructure expense is very, very minor. That's what I'm telling you. Good, good. Thanks ever so much, uh, Manos. This was a wonderful uh, speech. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot. I mean, this is it's going to simplify our life. Microwave. Definitely. <laughs> it has simplified our lives as well, to tell you the truth. You know, typically one of the students' concern is they wait too long for the masks to be sent out, fabricated, and come back. Now, they have an idea. They go to the lab. They print it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, they change the design. Tomorrow, they print something else. So yeah. it, it's very quick. Lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much, Siddiq. Okay. Once again, Manos, I think we are out of time. So please, Otman, I uh, leave the floor to you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Great to see you. And uh, hopefully, I will see you in person soon. Stay safe. Thank you so much, uh, Professor yeah. Manos, for this uh, presentation. And we wish to see you soon in our uh, meeting. Definitely. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye, Manos. Bye, uh, Manos. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Uh, Professor Saidi, the floor is yours. Professor Saidi. I think Mohammed is out. Uh, now I think uh, let's take a break of... Uh, 30 minutes and then we come back for another uh, presentation given by uh, Professor uh, Cynthia Force. Okay, so this, okay. uh, how, how long is the break, uh, Osma? What? How long is it going to be the break? 10 minutes? 5 minutes? No, 30 minutes. I think we have 30 okay. minutes. Now we have... Uh, Yes, we have 30 minutes. We will start at uh, 5 p.m. Yeah. Okay, okay, Othma. Thank you, okay. Bye-bye. Okay, share screen. Ahmed, you still here? Hi, Professor Cynthia. Good morning. How are you? Fine. How are you? Hey, I'm good. How has your conference been going so far? Yes, we are going good. We have uh, just finished with two uh, talks given by uh, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Nederingeta. And the second one is uh, from uh, given by Manus from uh, Zortia Tech. And we are working for the third one that's given by yours. By 
Professor Cynthia Fox. Well, and I just wanted to be sure I got on early enough to make you not nervous. Okay. No, it's, it's fine. So, would you like me to run my slides or do you want to run them? No, you can run uh, by yourself if it is possible. Okay. Hi, hi Cynthia. Good morning. How are you? Hi, Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia. This is Mohammed. How are you doing? I'm doing great, thanks. I'm sorry, I have a problem with my. Yeah, so. Uh, th thank you so much for accepting the invitation to deliver this keynote talk. I'm delighted to. Thank you for inviting me. I only a little bit wish I was personally in, Mo in Morocco this morning, but it's okay. <laughs> so, okay, let's... Nice to meet you, Cynthia. I am Tibor Bertsoy. I will be the moderator. From Thank you. So now we have a short break mm -hmm. till five o'clock. Yes. So I. See you later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I knew you had that uh, bit of a break. So, like I say, I wanted to get on early enough, and we could. I could pull up the slides. I wasn't quite dedicated enough to get up early in the morning to hear my colleagues' talks, although I would have enjoyed them. The time zones, you know? Yeah. Okay, so let's see. I wanted to share only that one. Uh, Mohammed? Yes, no, it's fine. You see these okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fair. It's all good. I'm just gonna check the. I'm just gonna check a couple of the movies. Yeah. Oh, of course, it's on my computer, so it will play. I'm not. Okay, this one. Ah, I'm not able to get that one. I had troubles with this earlier. Okay. All right, let me fix that one again. Now let me see if it will run. Okay. Here we go. Hmm. I fixed this once already, but let it check. Okay, back to share that screen. There we go. Okay. okay. This one. No, that one's not just playing either. Okay, let's go grab that one. I moved things from one presentation to another, of course. And sometimes the videos are uncooperative. Oh, this one doesn't have it. Okay. 
actually I'll stop sharing. You don't have to see me trying to find slides. So my heater just came on. Does it make enough noise that you hear it? Yeah, yeah. We can hear some noise. Okay, I may have to go to the other room then. Okay, that's the one I want. Time it's working. I don't know. So that was working. Okay. All right. Awesome. I think I've got slides. Just save them and I'm just going to move to the. Actually, maybe I'll just turn my heater off. That'll go off in a couple of minutes. Okay, no problem. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, my husband walks back and forth, dog walks back and forth, you know, the working from home thing. Can I sign off my share screen? Go to the here. Okay. And set. Do you want me to stop share so that you've got the front page that you were using? Okay. So if I stop share, do you, will it take us back to your front page? Okay, you can start sharing your presentation if you want. You're okay with that? Yeah. Oops. Okay. So are you are you still teaching? Are your classes still on? Yeah, yeah, we start uh, I think uh, months ago uh, giving some classes but uh, remotely. Remotely. Yeah. Ours the they wanted to do as many in person as possible but that didn't work out well. So everything ended up being Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. We took our, micro, our uh, electromagnetics labs and bought these really inexpensive DNAs. They're only about a hundred dollars and made kits for the students to take home. So they were still able to do real physical labs. Uh, the TAs helped by Zoom. So they still were able to do their labs but they all were doing them with just these little boxes that mm -hmm. computers. It worked out really well. Okay, it's uh, interesting. Yeah. So now we're trying to decide if we want to continue with that option to make it an option for students to either come to our you know, physical in person lab or to do the app. Uh, flexible. There is some noise with your voice. I don't know. Okay, is it quiet now? Is it no, it's no? noisy. No, it's still not good. Okay, is it is it jumping like back and forth? Yes. Okay. Can you turn off the video? Does that make the 
We have to wait 15 minutes. We have to wait 15 minutes. I think we can start. We don't have a coffee break, so we can uh, we can start. Okay, well, it's up, it's up to it's up to you and uh, Professor Tiavor. Well, I think okay. we can, I think we should start. If you want to start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, we can start. The floor uh, is yes. Yeah. Okay, that would be early though. Yeah. And so if anyone was coming, they would miss it. Do you think? Okay, so we have I, I would like to introduce you as the next uh, keynote speaker. Okay. So Cynthia Fursa is professor of electrical and computer engineering at the University of Utah. Dr. Fursa received her BSc in electrical engineering with a mathematics minor in 1985, MS degree in electrical engineering in 1988, and her PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Utah in 1994. She has applied her expertise in electromagnetics to sensing and communication in complex lossy scattering med med media, such as the human body, geophysical prospecting, ionospheric plasma, and aircraft wiring networks. She has taught <clears throat> electromagnetics wireless communication, computational electromagnetics, microwave engineering, antenna design, and introductory electrical engineering, and has been a leader in the development of flipped classroom. Dr. Hersa is a fellow of IEEE, and the, since uh, 2008, and the National Academy of Inventors. She is a past ETCOM member for the IEEE International Propagation Society and past chairman of the IEEE AP Education Committee. She has received numerous teaching and research award, including the 2020 IEEE Chen Tottai Distinguished Educator Award. She is a founder of Livewire Innovation, a spin-off company commercializing devices to locate intermittent faults in live wires. And uh, after the introduction, I can announce the title of the keynote speech, Arcs and Parks, Finding Faults on Aging Electrical Wiring. So please, Cynthia Force, you can start. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate the invitation to the Mediterranean Microwave Symposium. So thank you for having me as one of your speakers. So I'm going to stop my video and share my slides so that my minimal internet will do a better job with my voice. Thank you for having me. So I am going to talk about finding faults on electrical wires. And you might wonder why it takes a PhD to do this, but honestly, it's a very interesting and challenging problem. I've also put my lab website down here at the bottom. So if you click on this, you can get to several of the different uh, papers that we've written on this topic. So emlab.edu 
www.eng.utah.edu. Now my slides don't go. Okay, yes, I do need to say in full disclosure, I am a co-founder of a company that manufactures these components. It's really been a very exciting adventure to go from a device that was on the bench, you see what we had in the year 2000, to something that can be sold today. Here's the problem we're trying to solve. There are many problems that happen in flight, in aircraft that don't happen on the ground. A good or bad example is TWA 800, which crashed in 1996. This plane had had a number of intermittent failures that they had been unable to locate until it became catastrophic and the plane crashed. Swissair 111 is another of these examples. In this case, it was the in-flight entertainment system. So it wasn't even one of the most extreme systems on the plane. These wires were installed as expected. However, one of them chafed and frayed, resulted in a small spark, which became a larger fire and conflagration. So these are the sorts of problems that are very serious. The Space Shuttle Columbia in 1999 also had a failure. Three seconds into flight, the main engine controller went out. Fortunately, as with all flying devices, they had three redundant systems and it switched over and the flight went as planned. However, when they came back and they inspected everything, they found this chafe and fray where a wire had rubbed because of the vibration, had rubbed against another metal structure and had in fact short circuited out and caused the main engine controller failure. So these are the types of things that cause that problem. When we take wires and we put plastic types of insulation on them, with time, they do crack and crack and fray. So the cracks are fine until you get something like a water bridge across them. And of course this happens in anything that flies because things that go up get condensation, the condensation gets on the wires, and then it makes bridges between cracked insulation. That's what you see on the left. On the right, these are more typical of frays. Because things are vibrating, machines, aircraft, and so on, they're likely to wear off the insulation that's there, and that can also short out against those metal components. Now, these two pictures are taken from a plane that was considered to be fine. This is a plane that was in use when they brought it out, and they found hundreds of these types of failures. So what causes these faults? Probably the best study comes from the Navy safety uh, hazard incident data. The number one cause is chafed wire insulation that leads to short circuit and arcing. There are connector failures, failures from corrosion, other types of short circuits, but by far the largest number is chafed wire insulation. Now the challenge of this is that unless the wires are literally touching a metal part or if they literally have a wire bridge, that short circuit isn't there when the plane comes back down to the ground. Everything looks fine. So the problems happen up in flight, but they are not reproducible on the ground and therefore not locatable. So one of the suggestions for solving this, and this is in fact installed on most planes now and, in, and also on your um, air conditioning circuits in your house. So it's an arc fault circuit interrupter or an arc fault protection device. And what it looks for is instead of just looking for an overcurrent, it looks for small noise, electrical noise on the wires. So on the left, you can see the type of fault that would happen if you made a water bridge across cracked insulation and, and then it had a short circuit and there was a 10 amp circuit breaker attached. What happens is not only the wires that were damaged get hurt in this, um, in this spark, but the entire bundle can be damaged. Now that's a fairly serious problem because in older aircraft in particular, a lot of the multiple opportunity, a lot of the multiple wires that were used as alternatives were in the same bundle. So if you lose one wire, you may lose the entire set. On the right, you see what happens when an arc fault circuit interrupter has been used on that wire. Again, there was a there was a short circuit, there was a spark. However, the arc fault interrupter trip tripped on it quickly enough that the wires are not electrically damaged. You can see a little bit of blackening of the insulation, but the copper of these wires is fine. So the arc fault circuit interrupter has, present, has prevented the catastrophe, but now it presents a new problem. 
The problem on the left, we'd be able to locate with almost any device. That's an open circuit. We've broken some wires. The problem on the right is much more difficult because electrically, these wires are fine. If we put a continuity tester or a voltmeter or current meter, these wires are going to look great. So the arc fault circuit interrupter is an excellent device for pre preventing the catastrophe in the first place, but it's a very difficult device for maintainers to be able to find the fault to fix it later. So we've suggested a method for doing this, and that's reflectometry. Reflectometry is an electromagnetic uh, method. It's similar to radar, but it's used for electrical wires. So with reflectometry, as we know it today, you send an incident pulse down the wire, you get a reflected pulse back, and the time delay between those two pulses tells you the distance to the fault. The type of fault, whether it's positive or negative, tells you if it's an open or a short or, or a resistor or a capacitor even. So you can see that if we have a positive pulse, we have a open circuit. If we have a negative pulse, we have a short circuit. And if it's matched, we get no pulse at all. We look at the, refle at the reflection coefficient and it's a ratio of the load and the input impedance of the cable. And we get these different types of uh, reflections. Now I've just switched here from square pulses to a pulse that looks like a sink. This isn't really the pulse that we put in, but this is the pulse that we evaluate. So instead of considering square pulse reflectometry, we're going to be analyzing something that looks more like sink pulse reflectometry. There are several different approaches for reflectometry. In the time domain, typically there have either been pulses or steps. There also is analog frequency domain reflectometry, standing wave reflectometry. That's where you'd send a sine wave down the wire and get a reflection back. Your voltage network analyzers do this. There also is digital reflectometry, and that's what I'll be talking about today. That's where we're using a pseudo noise code. We call that spectral time domain reflectometry, or if we modulate, sine wave modulate that uh, pseudo noise code, that is spread spectrum time domain reflectometry. So all of these different types of reflectometry have different advantages and disadvantages. So TDR or time domain reflectometry is the gold standard. It's been used for decades. It's an excellent method and it works really well, except you can see it looks like a digital pulse. This could not be used well if you had an existing digital pulse that was running on your system. So this really can't be used on live lines. Frequency domain reflectometry with set, which sends sine waves could be used on live wires as long as you were using a frequency that was out of the range of the wire that was being tested. Because these wires in aircraft and other vehicles have so many different signals, it would be so difficult for us to choose a frequency that we could guarantee wasn't going to be on those wires. So that's also a relatively poor choice for testing live wires. Noise domain reflectometry is something that we have also proposed, or some people call it chaos reflectometry. That's where you use the existing noise that's on the wires and you use that as the reflection that comes back. That's good, but it's not quite as good as sequence or spread spectrum time domain reflectometry. So as I mentioned, sequence reflectometry uses a pseudo noise code, but in order to receive that code, we don't sample it. Sampling this fast, fast enough to have the type of accuracy we would like to take, would require a high-speed oscilloscope, which requires a lot of space and power, certainly couldn't be flown on a plane, and certainly couldn't be embedded into other applications. So sequence time domain reflectometry, we actually correlate this pseudo-noise code, getting a triangle as shown here, and then we evaluate the triangular um, correlation. Spread spectrum is the same thing, except that we have sine wave modulated it. And when we do the correlation, we get the sync function. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. Now, the advantage of STDR and SSTDR is that they are very good for live wires. You can make this pseudo noise code very, very small, well within the noise margin of the system that you are testing and still be able to pull it out because these signals are generally uncorrelated with the noise and other signals that are on the plane. So we're using the advantage, the same advantage that we see in code division multiple access. We're using that advantage of decorrelation to be able to test on live wires. So what is SSTDR, spread spectrum time domain reflectometry? 
It's like regular reflectometry, except we are sending a pseudo noise code, bringing it back and correlated, and then we are, co we are evaluating the correlated pulse, which looks like a sink. So this is how it works. We start with a pseudo noise code generator, a PN code generator, and we multiply that by a sine wave, or actually in the hardware, we're using a square wave. So it looks pretty much like a sine wave, but uh, we get slight differences. So we modulate it. And then we send that down into the cable and we get a reflection back. And we cross correlate the original modulated pseudo noise code with the reflection that came back from the cable, giving the signature that you see here. Oops, I should have gone through this. Now, oh dear, there we go. So this is what it looks like when you evaluate the correlation of the two signals. The stars are where the two signals line up and you can see that you get a large correlation when the incident and reflected signals are aligned, but not when they are not aligned. Let's run that one more time. So watch the two stars and notice that when they align, you get a large correlation right there and that uh, otherwise you get very small correlation, kind of like a little noise margin there. So this is what's going on in our system. Our incident signal is being correlated with the reflected signal giving us this type of response. So the advantage here is that TDR, again, the granddaddy, would interfere with other signals and it would also be interfered by other signals. S or SSTDR, on the other hand, has minimal or effectively no interference with other signals in either direction. TDR is very narrow in time, high in energy. SSTDR is very low in energy, broad in time. That's the advantage. So here's a picture of a mill standard 1553 data bus, kind of this sawtooth signal with the SSTDR on top. You can see it looks like just a little bit of noise on top of this signal. This is the largest SSTDR that we could use on this because this is the noise margin of the signal. But if we, may, if we do it smaller, you really can't see it in the picture. So this is working with the largest possible SSTDR that we can do. We can in fact evaluate uh, wires with this signal on them with about 53 decibels below this signal. So again, what we're looking for is this correlation shape. So this is the typical shape that you would see for an open circuit. So there's the open circuit response. The short, short circuit response is the negative of that. A match signal has no response and a mismatched impedance is the same shape except larger or smaller. So what does the analysis tell us? So we use the reflection coefficient the same way we would in regular reflectometry, except what we're looking at is the peak of the signal to evaluate that. So we consider the input, the impedance of the line, the characteristic impedance of the line, and the impedance of the load, and how that reflects the, affects the reflection coefficient. So there are many applications for this. As soon as you are able to test faults on wires that are live, you have many applications that otherwise have been untestable. Aerospace, when the systems are live and in flight. Utilities, which are virtually never brought down unless they are broken. Cable manufacturing, oil and gas industry, mining, vehicles, other types of trucks and cars, handheld and portable tools, Navy ships, academic research and development, and so on. So I'm just going to show you a few examples of some of the interesting things that we've been able to, to test on. So here is a commercial airline, a Boeing 747. Now, the best application of this would be to install it in the aircraft and leave it the whole time. However, certification is a very important aspect of this type of work, and we cannot be certified to do that on the large aircraft at this time. We currently are certified for small aircraft, and it's installed in the um, circuit breaker bay of those aircraft. But here's a 747. So you plug into the connector and you can see the types of faults that occur on this large plane. So this is a shaker table 
that is vibrating a piece of electrical aircraft wire against a metal plate. You can see the metal plate right here. The metal plate's been sharpened in this case, so the sparks will happen sooner. So this is a typical example of vibration-induced arcing and sparking. And you could see the sparks. There is a circuit breaker that's connected to this. In fact, it's an arc fault circuit breaker. But the arc fault circuit breaker was set was set in such a way as to not as to prevent false positives, and as a result, it did not trip during these tests that we were doing. We in, we located the fault 15 times. There were 15 sparks, 15 times prior to the arc fault circuit breaker tripping. So you can make a spread spectrum system that is running full time much more sensitive and much less false positive than the arc fault circuit breaker. So that was kind of exciting. So there's our vibration. So another example was the fire suppression harness on a military helicopter. The challenge with this is that they had six sensors in series and they never knew which one was causing the trouble. This particular harness was one of the large maintenance problems on this aircraft. So we used the system and detected the open faults and short circuit faults, which we induced on this particular suppression harness and uh, located them as planned. Now here's another important aspect of the engineering. So yeah, we've got degrees, we've got bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, PhD, we're fine looking at the wiggle plots, right? Hmm. The person who's working on this aircraft just needs to know what kind of fault it was and where, and they don't want to have to look or try to figure out these signals. So the biggest and most interesting challenge perhaps of this research has been making computer algorithms using machine learning of various kinds to locate the open and short circuit faults. So right down here where it shows that there is an open circuit or it shows that there was a short circuit and it tells you where it was, like how many feet away, how many meters, um, that is the single most interesting and challenging part of this research. And almost every kind of machine learning algorithm that we have applied has worked, it's worked fine. The challenge has been coming up with algorithms that are simple enough that they can be programmed in a PIC processor to be able to be integrated along with this system. Now, when I mentioned oil and gas, let me show you one of the serious challenges here. Do you see how these oil drilling platforms, which are drilling oil out in the, in the ocean, see how they're kind of separated? They have a huge umbilical cord going between the, um, the land with electricity and these platforms, and it goes in daisy chains in between these three platforms. The challenge is if they have any problem in that, electric, in that electrical wire, it can cost something like $100,000 every two minutes that these, that these are down. So it is an extremely high stakes maintenance challenge. So we were actually called with one of these uh, oil drilling platform challenges and we had to get on a plane and get there. Um, and even with that, we were faster than the maintainers who were diving looking for this problem. So once we hooked up, we were able to see the fault, tell them where it was and tell the divers exactly where to go to fix it. So this is a particularly important challenge. The other thing that's very different between this challenge and the one that you see on aircraft is just the size and scale. On aircraft, the largest distance that you need to evaluate is about 300 feet. And here it can be something like 8,500 feet or more. So it's, it can be well over a mile. So, uh, the goal, of course, is to find these faults close enough that a diver could go down and find them. And we were within 10 feet of the actual fault. Now, another really interesting challenge is corrosion. Corrosion happens in almost all electrical parts, especially those that are in harsh environments. So uh, what does corrosion look like? Corrosion is kind of like a resistor. It's like adding resistance to those cables. And in fact, that's what we saw here. So here's the SSTDR reflection with different amounts of corrosion, which correspond to different amounts of resistance. Uh, we corroded them, we measured them, and then we measured the resistance. So that was very interesting. The challenge with this is most people want to find corrosion long before the corrosion that you see here. These were some that we artificially corroded in an oven with. Um, with salt spray and some acid. So they want to find them much well before these particular, you know, before they reach the stage. So in that case, they need to find very, very small changes. 
So take a look at what the resistance 10 line looks like, the blue line. See how that's not very much resistance that you are looking for, not very much reflection. If you have a system that is built in and testing continually, you can be quite sensitive to these types of small changes. However, if you wanted to walk up with a device later, like a handheld, you might not recognize those very small faults and be able to find them. So the best way to locate very small faults or very small intermittent faults is to build the system in, to actually embed it into the system itself. So here's another example. In this case, we have a cable with a degrading shield. This is a braided shield that for some reason or other, we would expect to be, um, to be damaged on the outside of the shield. And this is showing you the magnitude of the reflection and how that is changing as we cut some of the strands of the shield. So whether it's the inside wire that's corroding or the outside uh, shield that's being damaged, either way, we can recognize the impedance change from that wire. Now let's look at some of the challenges. So here's a typical wire that's going to two different places. Most lines do go to two different places and that would be considered a branched wire. So you get a reflection that's related to each one of these, but looks what, look what happens on a branched wire. We have reflections at each of these points. And when we get there, we get both a reflection and a transmission through each one of these. And very quickly, we end up with a very complex system of faults that all superimpose and have to be evaluated. So here are the magnitudes of those reflections. And if we had absolutely no noise, these are reflection magnitudes that are readily detectable. The challenge is that they overlap on top of each other. Now we've shown these as just, point, as just uh, impulse responses, but there is no impulse response that we can test with. And in fact, if we make our SSTDR response so narrow, which you can, that you were able to eliminate these, it wouldn't have an, it wouldn't be able to go the distance. It'd be very high frequency and the low frequencies is what it takes to go distance. So it's a big challenge to do these multiple reflections. Here's the bigger challenge though. So here are the small reflections. Each one of those dots is one of the reflections from this line. And you can see this box here in the middle. See how many of those small reflections are just so small. This box has the magnitude that we consider to be our detectable range of the reflection coefficient. So you see that many of these reflections are actually out of the range of a measurement instrument. So here are the noise. So as soon as we have a, and why is, the, why is it out of our range? It's not really the range of the instrument. With most instruments, and this one included, you can basically bring down the noise margin of the instrument itself to near zero. However, the real system has variability that we would consider noise. So for example, if it's vibrating, what is the impedance of that wire? There's a little bit of variation. Or if you have a hot and cold, wet and damp, um, the system is just is vibrating and moving around. Those create real noise in the system that we can't control. And we have to consider that noise along with the rest of our tests. So if you are within the noise margin of your system, then these types of faults would be undetectable. So it's really the system that is limiting things, not the electronics. So there, yep, there's our noise margin. And that's showing what we, would, what we can and can't measure. So noise and measurement error are the limiting factors for network mapping algorithms. Well, here's an example of a large and very branched uh, network on a Sikorsky aircraft. Uh, they did use this system on the Sikorsky and they found that they were able to isolate numerous wire faults, uh, which in this case, this is a lab, so they induced the wire faults. So in spite of the fact that they had a very branched system that they were working on, they were able to locate many of these faults, but of course there were some that you can't. Now, interestingly, I've been developing this for aircraft my entire career, and it is finally on small aircraft and some helicopters. However, the area that I didn't even know about when I was starting my work that is so important is rail. So network rail is the largest rail system in the, in the world. It runs through almost all of England. And it has, there are many problems that happen in rail applications. Now, I would have thought that the problem was going to be the electricity within the trains themselves, but actually the biggest challenge is in the control system for these aircraft sorry, for these rail systems. Uh, 
So the types of problems that happen are cable theft, vandalism, and general degradation. Cable theft, wait a minute. That is the largest maintenance issue for rail applications. So um, the, the lines that control the rails are in small concrete um, tubes that run, along the, that run along rail systems. Many of these go through rural areas where there's no one there to police them. It's large copper cables because they have to carry large uh, currents to be able to control these rail systems. So they have large currents, they're large copper cables, they're worth a lot of money. Someone goes to their local hardware store, buys a hundred foot roll of lamp cord, you know, just the kind of stuff that you plug lamps in with, connects it on either side of this copper cable, cuts the cable, the continuity tester recognizes the continuity is still there because of the lamp cord, they cut the wire, they roll it into the bed of a pickup truck and they drive away with it. Everything is fine until the system attempts to put a large current down this cable. And of course it burns out the lamp cord and now you have an open circuit. However, the cable thieves have already left with the cable. So this is apparently a very large problem that happens at least once a month in Salt Lake City. And I'm sure it happens more than that at, at network rail. So surprisingly, this cable theft application was the application that really made the live wire technology um, shine in, in bulk applications. So we developed a product called Cable Guardian, which is for condition, fault, condition monitoring and fault finding. Now you notice it's a relatively large device, waterproof box, the ability to clamp around um, existing cables without having to disconnect them at all. That's what those little round clamps are for. So all the time that we have been trying to shrink things down and make them smaller for aircraft, turns out in rail, they don't care. You know, it's going to just be sitting outside, make it as big as you want. So having all of the space that's needed for all the electronics, wireless communication and so on was a real luxury in this application. So here's the full configuration. They do have a network system. Things go in all different directions. It needs to have wireless communication, control systems, database, and it needs to be linked into the database that's already functional uh, in the systems that they have. So the electromagneticist in me is very excited about the SSTDR, but honestly, this was a huge engineering project involving virtually every aspect of electrical engineering and system engineering. So this was first put in trial sites throughout the UK, and it's now been um, approved and adopted for use throughout the entire system. So I mentioned the entrepreneurial journey. Anytime that you try to put something into other systems, there are many, many challenges. It's not only technical, it's not only electromagnetics, it's signal processing, it's circuit design, it's power control, it's, uh, it's certification. All of these challenges roll up together to give the product and the application real meaning and real life. And this was one of the most exciting things that has happened in my career was when full acceptance for the British rail system finally came through. So SSTDR today, there is a problem and these problems happen in virtually all types of electrical systems. There are many applications. We have barely scratched the surface of the applications where this can be used. I've shown you how we've used this to detect open and shorts, such as faults and short circuits, and also resistive things such as corrosion. It can also be used to find capacitive and inductive faults, such as show up in photovoltaic plants. So there are many applications for this particular model. So this is where we've gone. In 2000, my first PhD student graduated. This is the board that we were using at the time large and clunky and trying to take that plus a large transformer on an aircraft, I got stopped at every single uh, checkpoint anytime I was flying anywhere. And then we built it into smaller boards. So right here, you'll notice that we've got some that can be connected on either side, named the Wilma, uh, connected on either side. And there's a board inside there that is just a smaller version of the board we first built. And then gradually things got smaller. We actually built a chip, oops, sorry. we built a chip, it's very small. And this was great, except it's expensive to build a chip. So we used a chip for several years and then FPGAs got very efficient, very fast. So we currently use an FPGA in all of the systems that we are designing. Now, this is only a small fraction of the students and engineers that have been involved in this project. 
That was one of the striking things that the young professor, who I was at the time, would never ever have imagined the hundreds and hundreds of engineers that we have interfaced with in order to build these systems. It's been very exciting. And I want to say a great big thank you to all of my students and all of my colleagues who have helped in this project. So again, here's the website, emlab.eng.utah.edu, where you can go and find more of our papers to find out more information about this entertaining application. So thank you uh, very much. And I'll be glad to answer questions. Professor Tibor? Okay, I think uh, Tibor is out. Yes, I think so. Well, I'm, I'm here, Cynthia. Hi, how's it going? <coughs> Excellent, <laughs> thank you. This beautiful presentation, I'm amazed. You've devoted your life uh, for all these and you know, the violent problems and, and the Taking the faults uh, and building all these equipments, and it looks like that you're also making a lot of money. This is uh, well, <laughs> the money all goes back in to build the next one. <laughs> but it's okay. It's well, uh, here is the question. Actually, I've been working with the Turkish Railways for years. Ah, okay. And I I faced many many faults. I am a microwave engineer, but testing business is microwave. However, the problems are not microwaves. I mean, the real problems. Yeah. Once I had uh, a problem with the grounding uh, of the systems, like uh, uh, we're using the ERTMS, uh, European Rail uh, Signaling System on the trains, and we have built all these uh, signaling systems and everything. And in one side of the, uh, uh, of the, of the track, which is nearby Konya. This is a, a, a city in the middle of Turkey. And, and it, the train was stopping immediately. Of and, course. I, and, and they built, uh, I mean, they hired the National Science uh, Foundation, a group or research institution from Turkey. And I was also consulting the Turkish Railways and people, then those guys just came and made a lot of measurements and so on. They could not find the real problem. And then all of a sudden they came back to me. They said, oh, Professor Yaman, what can we do about this? I said, what is the problem? Actually, and there was a problem with the distributed grounding system of the trains, of the sets. Okay, this is a serious problem. And, and, and my question is this, uh, I saw that problem and I said, okay, uh, there were some uh, uh, paratoners and, and stuff. And there were some exchanges, uh, the, the voltage exchange stations in between. And I said, we have to, uh, they're producing a wide frequency band, uh, a spectrum, uh, while they're changing the zone. And the trains are changing the zone band. Uh, and, and there was a system that took the megahertz, uh, and it was just uh, really affected by the system. Uh, then I designed some trap circuit. You see, ah. just so that I can just turn everything down and then go. So um, my question is this, when you're dealing with the trains, as far as grounding is concerned, this is a very difficult uh, issue uh, on the trains. The, body, the whole body is a, is a ground, of course. But in the meantime, the body is distributed system, and then it creates some problems. So the, the question is this: I mean, I don't know what type of problem did you face? If you really, are you you are really interested in, in the broken cables, disconnected cables, isolation problems, etc. I understand this reflection of this and and this COVID and so on. Uh, so on. So you are absolutely <laughs> distributed ground challenging in every application. You've seen them in print, but they also are there in Distrib Distributed grounds are used on anything where you don't want to have um, 
you know, where you're worried about safety. So they'll put many ground points down. And one of those breaks, they might get disconnected, they might get wet, wet's really common. Um, and, they may have been, and they may have been interfered with, as you were mentioning. In our case also, they may get stolen. The cables going down the wire, going down to the grounds because they're big, they're worth money. So they may just get stolen. So those are serious problems. Um, but they do in fact show up as reflections. If you use a reflectometry and you've got the two cables like this and you've got a reflection coming back on one or the other, if it's two isolated cables, you can't tell the difference between which one is the one that's broken, but still you'll get to the right location. If you have two cables and then a ground underneath, which many of these do, so like a, it's like a third cable, um, you have to consider uh, multi-conductor transmission line theory and things are a little bit more confusing in that case, but you still get reflections back. You still get distinct and observable reflections. The thing that will go right is you'll get the reflection. The thing that goes wrong is the velocity of propagation is different. And so if you don't use the correct velocity of propagation, you will um, misinterpret the location. So the time will be right, but the distance will not. So this has one velocity of propagation and this, you know, would have a different velocity of propagation. So if you consider both of those, if you know you have a ground fault, you are likely to use a different velocity of propagation than if you know that you have a two wire fault. Um, fortunately, the function of the system will normally tell you that. Uh, there, are, there are other things on these rail systems that will tell you, you know, our ground isn't working, but you still need to locate it so that you can go out and fix it. So this is a extremely interesting and challenging problem. So I've mentioned okay, some reflection. The other challenge there is many of the ground faults are very small and the time. So corrosion being a problem with grounds. And so you are likely to get small effects and small effects and small effects just look intermittent until you finally get big enough. So even our system, you'll just get small reflections, small reflections, small reflections, and what we start targeting appears to be a building set of reflections at this location. The next time you are out there, inspect your ground, as opposed to saying, okay, it's a crisis, plane, train's not working, got to be there today. So it's so extremely interesting. So you see why these are really interesting for a PhD. You know, when you come over here, I'll... Uh, may I have a remark? Okay. May I have a remark? Please, uh, please. I enjoyed your presentation, but at this moment, we have not only electrical wires, but optical fibers as well. Mm -hmm. Would you comment mm -hmm. on this problem? Sure. So sure. he's right. So we have electrical cables that are typically copper or aluminum. And we also have optical cables. In many cases, they are in the same bundles. Not always, but in many cases, they are. So optical cables do not generally degrade the same way copper cables do. They usually fail catastrophically. So it's not that you just get a little problem, you just, they break. Um, there can be some small reflections when they start getting degradation in the coatings, but they generally are far more sudden in their degradation than the copper is. So that's one difference between them. There is optical time domain reflectometry already used today, and that is a pulse, but it cannot be used on live um, fiber optic cables. What they do when they're testing fiber optic cables usually is they have many extra cables in the bundle because you rarely repair fiber optics you just replace. So you just put many cables in the bundle to act as replacements when you need them. So they usually just move the signal to another set of those cables and then test the optical cables. So they are not generally tested live. So the simple pulsed optical time domain reflectometer actually works really well in that application. We have not seen a commercial application that it makes sense to put a continuous tester on an optical system yet. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't be, you know, 
that we might find something in the future, but there's been no sense in doing that today. So we have no optical products because the existing OTDRs are sufficient for today's applications, I would say. So. I think you're muted, Tibor. You can activate your uh, mic, Professor Tibor. You are not activating your mic. Professor Tibor, you can activate your mic, please. We, uh, we can't hear you, Professor Tibor. <clears throat> so, one more question. That in some cases, the signal is transmitted over uh, an electrical wire or cable, then it is connected to an optical fiber. So in that case, that is a mixture of, of transmission media. Mm -hmm. Would you comment on this? Okay, sure. sure. So He's right. There are many applications where the copper transfers down to optics and vice versa. So the signal that we put on the copper cable is also going to be transmitted a little bit onto the optical cable, but not very much because of the sampling that happens when you convert from electric, electro to optics or optics to electric. So there's not very much of our signal going onto the optical cable. So we are testing the copper cable well, but not the optics. We are not testing the optics. Now, there is something else interesting that I think you might be interested in with this question. And that's that the testing method we're using is sending a pseudo noise code and then correlating it. Correlation is just shifting them against each other, multiplying them and adding them up or integrating them. We use just a time domain shifter. We use a mixer to multiply them and we use a capacitor to add them up. Okay, that's great, but how about optics? It turns out that optics does correlation in much better, more efficient ways than electricity does. So correlation and optics, you can correlate the entire, all of the possible time delays instantly by just using an optical filter, a Bragg grating. So you can do this correlation optically so fast, virtually instantaneously. Where we are doing this sequentially, they are doing it in parallel. So we've actually done a design where we can test electrical wires using an optical correlator. So in that case, we, we put the signal on the wire electrically, it comes back electrically, we convert it to optics so that we can use the optical correlator. This could be used on optical cable testing as well, but again, we haven't found a commercial application where it made sense. But it is really cool that you can go back and forth between electro optics and use the advantage of both systems. So I haven't found the application yet that would produce the money to do the optical chip that would be needed to do this. Thank you very much. It was an interesting answer. Are there any other questions or remarks? That is my... Uh, Professor you. Tibor, we have an, uh, in this uh, chat section, we have another question. If you can read it in the chat section. Okay, so then we finish the session and thank you for the presentation. Uh, uh, have, Professor Tibor, we have still one question. No. Okay, I I have one question from Sean McKellar. Uh, the question is, you mentioned this is a technology that has many yet to be developed uh, applications. So what are some of the future applications you may uh, research or may, you may looking for? Okay, that's a really good question. Thank you, Sean. So, the applications that I've really shown in this talk have been applications of fine, open and short circuits or resistance in the case of corrosion. So it's 
opens, short, and resistance. All of those, the pulse stays the same shape. So they're very similar applications. There are anything that moves, power distribution systems, all of those are kind of being evaluated one at a time by the existing companies that are doing this. So as a professor, I'm kind of leaving those alone. We're just letting the companies go through those applications sort of one at a time. But the applications that I'm really interested in right now are the ones that are not opens, shorts, and resistances. The ones that are complex impedances like capacitances and inductances. So I've been working on photovoltaics most recently because finding fo faults in photovoltaics requires finding faults in series and parallel capacitive units. Each panel is basically like a giant capacitor. So I'm really interested in those things that have complex impedance. Photovoltaics is one of those. Now, if you just imagine for a minute all of the things that you would normally measure in a vector network analyzer, DNA, those all have complex impedance. All of those could be measured with this type of device. And the disadvantage of using a DNA is you can't measure them live and you can't measure them in more the environments. So being able to measure all the different applications you can measure, that you can imagine with complex impedance and being able to do those on live systems or noisy electric environments are really interesting to me. So that's where I'm taking this research in the future. Okay. Are there any further questions or remarks? If not, then thank you for your presentation. That Thanks. is the end of the session. It was nice to listen to this talk. Goodbye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cynthia. For thank you. Cynthia, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, uh, Tibor, for sharing the session. Thank you very much. Yeah, come on. Take care. So I would like to thank all the speakers for uh, today. And uh, we are uh, very excited to see you, uh, all of you, uh, with us uh, by tomorrow. We still have uh, more great uh, plenary talks. So I think for tomorrow we have uh, seven uh, talks. So join us uh, and by then be st uh, stay safe and uh, healthy. So I think now we, we have to close this uh, uh, session and see you by tomorrow. Thank you, Osman. You've done a great job. Thank you so much, my friend. Thank you, Professor Siddiq. You are the best one. And uh... <laughs> okay, I appreciate your help. Okay, so okay. Good night. Okay, good night. Hope to see you. In the afternoon. In the afternoon. Bye bye. Take okay, care. and you can join for us by tomorrow. Okay. Your presence is a honor for us. Inshallah, hopefully. <laughs> Inshallah, hopefully. Inshallah. Okay. So, bye-bye.